Good afternoon. Welcome to the Township of Whitewater Region Regular Council meeting for Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021 at 4.49 p.m. And at this time, instead of having a prayer, I would ask for a moment of silence for the 215 students found deceased in a BC residential school. Thank you. So at this time, item number three, I'll ask if there's any disclosure of interest for tonight's proceedings from any council member. Clerk seeing none, we'll go ahead to 4.1 public meetings. Ivan will read the first part. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I'll just quick, uh, quick uh, read a quick statement relating to the zoning bylaw amendments being uh, considered by council tonight. If any person or public body does not make an oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Whitewater Region before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision to the, to the local planning appeal by tribunal. The person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal or LPAT, unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. Under section 3411 of the Planning Act, it states that if council decides to refuse an application or refuses or neglects to make a decision on an application within 120 days of receiving the application, the applicant or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal to LPAT by filing an appeal with the clerk of the municipality. And lastly, under section 3419 of the Planning Act, it states that not later than 20 days after giving of notice of the passing of a bylaw, the applicant any person or public body who made oral submissions at the public meeting or made written submissions to council before the bylaw was passed may appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the municipality. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. 4.1, Caroline. This amendment is for the property located at Park Lot 11, Concession 9, Caroline. Will staff please give an overview of the application? Yeah, uh, so the present application uh, pertains to allowing the uses uh, of a farm, farm uses on the concerned property. So the property is currently in a residential two zone, the north portion of the property and the south portion is an agricultural zone. Uh, so to allow farm uses, we need to change that R2 zone to, 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 an agri to a rural zone or agricultural zone. Uh, so that's one part of it. And the second, second part is to reduce the minimum rear yard depth for a livestock, livestock building to nine meters, and also to reduce the minimum setback to center line of any street to 17 meters. And these setbacks are uh, in strict accordance with the minimum distance separation. That was calculated by staff using the livestock information from the property owners. Uh, so they're proposing a couple horse, in fact, five horses, two beef cattle and 15 chickens. And we've calculated the MDS with that, that information. They comply, they can comply with the 85 meter setback from the nearest dwelling, but do require reductions in the zoning setback uh, to meet, uh, to comply with the MDS. So the zoning requires greater setbacks uh, than the MDS, which is mo more restrictive and staff feel that the MDS is sufficient to, to provide for compatibility between uses. Uh, so with that, uh, staff are supportive of the application. Uh, it will not affect the rural character of the area and it will support agricultural uses in our township. So we're supportive of this. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Um, will the applicant, if present, like to speak? So I do, I believe Robin is on um, on the call now. If, she, if there's anything she wants to add, Robin, if you want to speak up. No, there's nothing else we'd like to add. Okay, okay thank you. So the motion is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to the zoning categories of the property described as part of Lot 11, Concession 9, Caroline, from Residential 2 Zone to Rural Exceptional Exception 37 Zone and from Agricultural A Zone to Agricultural Exception 18 Zone. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Dave Mackay and Councillor Jackson. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mackay, sorry, and Councillor Jackson. 
Thank you. Um, any discussion? Show of hands, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, please. Okay, uh, this may be go towards Ivan. Uh, I, I know the property and I know the people and, and I have no problem. I'm just wondering, Ivan, can this go on the property as that no more than these many animals would be allowed? Um, I would just say that, sorry, I didn't, were, were you finished, Councillor McLaughlin? My apologies. Yes, yeah, go ahead. You, you tell me what you're thinking and... Yeah, so if they if the if the owners uh, would propose greater number of livestock, we would have to recalculate the MDS and we would have to determine if that affects the setback. So at an 85 meter setback, uh, there is sort of limited space for them to build the, the barn. Uh, so I think that they would probably not be able to increase substantially. They may be able to increase slightly, but not substantially. I think that if we just leave it as it's noted here, um, and consider MDS for any future increases in livestock, that will be sufficient moving forward. Okay, because my, my problem is not the owners, and I, and I understand the owners, and I, and I think that they'll, they'll comply to it, but if it moves to a second hand, then we still have got control over it, I'm correct? I would say yes, by virtue of the MDS that's gonna be approved in conjunction with the building permit. Yes, we will have control. Okay, because that, that, that's my only really concern. It's, it's not, not having this being erected a, and the building and, and the people that are doing it because I think they would be uh, quite susceptible to, to that. It's just when it, when it moves from hand to hand, then that's where the problems start. So if you think that's okay, then I'm all right with it. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Mackay. Councillor Mackay, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Don't mute it. Now your video is gone. Okay. I just wondered how big a chunk of land the, the, in the yellow, the map in yellow. Uh, so the property is uh, five acres or two hectares. So that's five acres is typical of a hobby farm. So it's five acres in size. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I see none. Okay, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. Now we move on to 4.2. Zoning bylaw amendment. Part lot 20, Ross, concession seven, Magnesium Road. Ivan. Yeah, thank you. So this application pertains to restricting residential uses on a retained agricultural property. So the proponent has filed for a severance. It was approved. He's severing off the home, the existing surplus farm dwelling and uh, several accessory structures and sort of outcrop rocks areas. Um, and what's left is uh, essentially it's, uh, what's the size here? Uh, it's just shy of a hundred acres, if you will. Uh, it's not noted in the report here, but it's just shy of hundred acres. The severed parcel was seven acres. So this is typical for agricultural designated lands where we're sort of restricting residential uses to protect the future use of the lands in yellow on that map that you see there. Uh, so this is consistent with the provincial policy statement, official plan, and uh, and and this is consistent with past practice for the township. So uh, very uh, basic application, and we're supportive of it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So I move down now to if the applicant would like to. Is there an applicant on line? See, uh, clerk. Uh, I, there's somebody that says Robin, but I feel that, so I don't know who that is, but. Robin is the, the applicant for the past application. So okay. Robin, you could leave now. Your, your application has been approved by council. I will note, uh, I'm not seeing the applicant, Phil uh, Leslie present in the meeting, uh, Mayor Moore. Okay. So if the applicant is not going to speak, then we'll move on. Um, a recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to the zoning category of the property described as part of Lot 20, Concession 7, 
Magnesium Road slash Queens Line from Agriculture A Zone to Agricultural Exception 21 Zone. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor uh, Councilor McLaughlin and Reed Reeker. Okay, thank you. Uh, dis uh, discussion, please. Show of hands, please. Councillor Mackay. Councillor Mackay, please. Yeah, I just want to say that is a big chunk of rock. So we're really not losing farmland there. That's 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 the old trip farm, and that's rock. So I, I'm all for it. That's great. So I'll just add to that is that uh, typically when we do surplus lot dwellings, we want to reduce the size as much as possible and the county and staff here at the township were supportive of that size on the basis of what you've indicated, Councilor McKay, is that there's large, large outcrop of rocks there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor McLaughlin, please. Yeah, uh, Ivan, just for clarification now, can you can he build on the retained parcel? Um, so, so that's that, that. The answer to that is no. So, the retained parcel that's shown in yellow on this map that's in front of you. Um, yes. It we're restricting should... residential uses on that. That's the farm agricultural portion of the property that will be restrict residential uses and saved forever a day for agricultural purposes. So he couldn't build a, a, a house on it or? No. Like the owner? Okay. No, I should have known, Ivan. I just needed clarification. I, I was pretty sure you that. And uh, yeah, like seven acres and you're not losing any, any land. I know that for sure. No. So that answers my question. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. <clears throat> now we move on to 4.3. Uh, 103 Rapid Road. Ivan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this application pertains to building a detached garage before the main dwelling. So what happens in our zoning bylaws is a detached garage, a shed, a gazebo, they're all defined as accessory buildings. They're accessory to the main use. The main use would be, uh, in this case, would be residential, would be the house. Uh, so uh, with the, the current state of affairs in the housing market and contractors and building materials, uh, Mark, Mark being the owner and Debbie are looking to build their garage first. Uh, they would be storing grass cutting equipment and, and water amenities, because this is a waterfront property on the Ottawa River. There'd be no business, no, no occupation, no commercial uses in the garage. So they're just looking to build the garage this year uh, and then looking likely to build the house in the next couple couple of years. So uh, since the zoning bylaw doesn't allow for this, uh, they, they're amending the, the amending the zoning bylaw to allow for uh, the private accessory garage, more or less a thousand square feet prior to the construction of the main main residential use. Uh, we've seen these, a council has seen these applications. I, I did a cursory review of our zoning bylaws and it appears there have been some of these in the past. Uh, so this won't affect the rural waterfront character of that area and not significantly impact any local scenic landscape. So we've received no concerns from adjacent property owners as well. Staff are supportive of this and uh, we're looking forward to uh, the owner building his house in the next couple of years. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Is uh, the applicant in present? Do we know? Um, we've no uh, we can be present. He's communicating with us and is not present. He's watching through the vi live, live video, but he's not present tonight. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to the motion. The motion is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to the zoning category of property located at 103 Rapid Road from waterfront vicinity zone to waterfront vicinity exception 53 zone. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Winstead, Councillor Mackay. Okay, thank you. Now we'll go to discussion. Show of hands, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, please. Yeah, I, I've seen these come through before. Not, not so much, I don't remember this kind uh, of building, but I know that they put trailers on uh, lots before, but we always put a timeline on it. And I'm wondering if uh, 
if a timeline could be put on there, Ivan, that within four years that the house has to be built? Would that be, uh, I, um, I'm just that, that, you know, I have no problems with, with what's going to happen and I understand all of it. I just think that uh, other people have been denied and I know that. And, and uh, I just wonder, if you went to approve, because I can see lots more of these coming uh, as well. And uh, I think there should be a timeline put on it, but that's just my thoughts. I'll pass it over and uh, listen to what you have to say. Well, I, I guess a few things. Um, it's not cheap to do this. So um, it, there is an application fee of $900 to get it before council. So um, people are generally reluctant to do this because of that additional cost. Um, so I've chatted with many people who've, who've considered it, but I've never heard, heard back from them. Um, as it relates to timeline, I think the application that's before council, the, the applicant is not proposing to include a timeline or be bound or restricted to a timeline. Um, if council is going in that direction, I would request that we table the application um, and provide an opportunity for the applicant to speak. Um, with that being said, I don't, see any issue with this garage existing for 10 years. Um, it's not going to generally affect the area, um, whether it's 10 years or greater. Um, it, it's merely a thousand square foot garage gonna be used to maintain the property. So he'll be able to keep the grass cut and neat um, and then use the property that he's purchased, uh, which is a waterfront property. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily against or for it, but I think I just don't see that there's extreme merit in, uh, in applying a timeline. But I'll leave it to council to deliberate on that. And, uh, and if we are thinking a time frame that we table the decision and you give me an opportunity to speak to the owner. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. So does anyone have any concerns on what Council McLaughlin has uh, brought up? Seeing none, so then we will carry on and approve. Um, if anybody has any other questions before we move on. Seeing none, I'll ask for a, a, a vote. All in favor of the motion. Carried, thank you. Now we move on to number five announcements. We'll start with Reeve Rigier. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on be, uh, as the lead of human resources and on behalf of Mayor Moore and all of council, I do just want to extend a warm welcome to all of our summer students that are joining us. Uh, we have Madison Tomasini from Records Management Clerk. We have Nicole Moore, our planning analyst. We have two public works laborers, which are Riley Chevalier and Chase Newburn, and three park attendants, Kevin Reddy, Ryan McIntyre and Travis Lammy. So again, just want to extend a warm welcome to our summer students. And if everyone is out and about and sees them, extend the same. Thank you very much, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Welcome to all the people that are visiting for the summer. Um, Councillor Olmstead. Yeah, thank you. Um, after a very eventful week, I'm gonna keep my announcements to myself. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor McLaughlin? No, I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay. I'd like to give my condolence to the Toronto Maple Leafs who've choked again. And then I'd like to wear this hat for the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jackson? Nothing at this time, but I think he needs to take the hat off. It is a council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Nicholson. Mayor, I just, uh, I, I saw there was an announcement today about uh, water conservation for our uh, three hamlets supported by water system. And I was wondering if, uh, if we could just get any more context from, from staff on that announcement today, if that was possible. Um, Clerk is Lane with us. I am Mayor. Okay, do you have any updates then for council? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, so we had an um, uh, advisory went out uh, to, to, to limit the water in our water systems as we we were nearing uh, in Beechburg 
uh, water system. We're nearing our uh, capacity. Um, we're about 90% uh, in our capacity of, and the max volume is 973 cubic meters per day. Um, we're sitting in, in the in 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 eight in, in low eight hundred, so Aqua, um, uh, I'm advised us if we can put on the um, um, the, the uh, I put on the advisory just for for, for, for I'm limiting the water um, every second day. So if you're if if your address is a, is a uh, even number, um, you can you can water your, your gardens and your lawn on on the on the even days, and if you're and if you're odd. Um, uh, numbered address to do on, on the odd days of, of the week. So uh, of, of the month, sorry. Yeah, and, and Aqua um, is monitoring it uh, daily um, and hopefully we get some um, water which, which would help the, the residents um, um, with their gardens and their in the grass. And if we, see, if we see the number come down, we can take it off. Okay, and that is for watering from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. only, right? That's correct, thank you, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nicholson, you okay with that? That's perfect, thank you very much, Lane. I appreciate that, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other reports, we'll move on to, or sorry, announcements, we'll move on to reports. Proposed access easement, um, recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region, direct staff, to take the necessary steps to transfer an access easement in favor of Dave and, David and Susan Shields to provide access to the property described as part of lots 75, 76, and 77 of Plan 6 in Beechburg. Motion and a seconder, please. Reeve Rigier and? Uh, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin. And this goes to Ivan, please. Yep. Uh, so the present application pertains to providing access to a property in Beechburg uh, that is located uh, adjacent to the townships or the Beechburg Township or Beechburg Fire Hall and the Beechburg Lions Club. Uh, so back in, uh, in 93, uh, the former village of Beechburg closed up a portion of Hannah Street, of which two parts on a plan were created, a survey plan. One part was transferred to this property owner in question of this application. And the other portion, which was supposed to be transferred to him for the purposes of giving him access to a municipal road was in fact transferred to the Beechburg Lions Club. Uh, so it appears that while it was part of the bylaw, it appears as though it was, it was omitted or it wasn't transferred to, I guess in this sense, the right person. Um, with that being said, the Beechburg Lions Club has since built a septic system on this portion of property behind the building, and it has uh, created sort of a landlocked issue for David and Susan Shields, uh, who own the property in blue on, on the plan here. Uh, so um, essentially, as part of an omission, I guess, from the former village of Beechburg, an error, an accidental error, um, this property no longer has frontage and generally to, uh, to better serve our community and provide for an appropriate development pattern, you should have frontage and access to the municipal road. This property has neither. Uh, so staff have been working with the proponent and his contractor, which is uh, Varekin Homes, uh, to try to find a solution to provide him access and allow for the issuance of the building permit. Uh, we re reviewed several options, including a new road, which is quite, quite costly, transferring land for a driveway, which would impede access to the Beechburg Fire, fire Hall. Um, so we've, we've found that the most feasible approach is to grant the property owner an access easement over what's shown here on the plan as the bolded red or pink color, part four on the plan. It's already surveyed. It would provide access from the existing entrance to the, to the Beechburg Fire Hall. Uh, to his property, it's 40 feet wide and would service his needs and access to his driveway. Um, so staff are bringing this forward to council essentially to correct uh, what was appears to be anyway an ac accidental omission and will uh, will correct and allow for development of this lot so it allow for a new new home in the village of Beechburg service by municipal water hydro and, and likely uh, likely natural gas. Uh, so staff present us to council and we're looking for your for your feedback on this on this approach. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, show of hands, please. Uh, uh, 
Oh, oh, Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson, please. Yeah, uh, Mayor, just uh, thank Ivan for this <laughs> initiative to solve this problem. I mean, a 1993 challenge has come up and, I, and I'm glad we found a way to do it. I just had two questions about the easement. The first one just has to do with, with services. Um, you can still connect to municipal water through that easement, that there's no restriction there? So yeah, so the terms of the easement will allow for him to bring services through the easement. Um, and the easement will also speak about maintenance uh, and uh, maintenance of that portion of land and snow removal. So that terminology, I, would, I wouldn't want to take a guess to see what it would say, but our, we're going to work, work with our lawyer to draft that terminology. Uh, which will form part of the of the official easement. So yeah, you, you will, he will be able to bring servicing through there subject to certain conditions as established by our lawyer. Yeah. Excellent. The second question just has to do with um, access for the fire department. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great way to serve both. I just want to make sure that um, that doesn't restrict it. There's no restriction on the fire department's access to their building or that turning area as a result. Yeah, so the key thing in the in again in the terms of the the access easement will 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 read that neither us nor uh, neither the township or the proponent will be able to encumber the access. So the goal here is specifically to drive your vehicle from the road to your driveway. Uh, it's not intended to be used for parking uh, by the fire department and or um, by the property owner. Again, in 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 circumstances where the fire department needs to park there, well that that'll be a, a situation where we can't avoid, but again, uh, the, the whole goal here is to not encumber the, the point of access. That's perfect. I am very satisfied with that. Thank you, Ivan, for this innovative solution. Thanks. Okay, so I only have one question. Um, my concern is the this part four that is now in the red, um, that has turned out to be a parking lot for the Lions Club. So how is that going to affect traffic on Hannah Street um, if we move them park cars out of there. So, yeah, so I guess ultimately we do understand that there has been some parking there. Um, we're going to see if there's, we're going to communicate with the Lions Club to get a sense of when it was being used and how many vehicles were being parked there and see if we could find alternative locations for that. So, um, so likely they will be accommodated there or we would look at, at finding appropriate spots on Hannah Street. I'm not sure, Lane, if there's a possibility of, of, uh, of finding or, or putting on, on, on street parking along Hannah Street, but we could examine that, uh, Mayor Moore, in greater detail in consultation with the Lions Club. Sure, sounds good, yep. Um, seeing any other questions? Councillor Mackay. Councillor Mackay, please. Yeah, so they'll just drive down that street and just drive through where the fire trucks, instead of going to the hall, go straight through to their lots. Is there, how many lots is there? Just one single family home will be built on that property. So it's all one property now. It's shown as separate lots, but it's all one property. Uh, there'll be okay. one driveway. The driveway on the sketch that they've provided us connects pretty well perfect with that part four. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, so at this time I'll ask for a vote. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Now we move on to 6.2. Whitewater and Wildlands Tours Limited. Recommendation of the Council of Township of Whitewater Region having given consideration of the preliminary development proposal for the property described as part of lot 13, Ross Concession 11, provided the following direction. One that the approval authority is satisfied that the de this development can proceed by consent severance application and two, that a development agreement be prepared for council consideration related to the transfer of the fire access route pursuant to the development of the private property and three, that the list of required reports and studies listed in this report be provided to the proponent. Motion and a seconder, please. Councilor Olmsted, Councilor Jackson. Thank you. And this goes to Ivan, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the present application before council, in fact, it's not an application. It's just seeking some direction from council. 
um, to provide some, some consideration and, and, and some preliminary or uh, acceptance in principle. Uh, nothing would, uh, would, would allow, uh, the next step, I guess, is what I would say is that uh, Mr. Kowalski will have to enter either into agreements, um, which will return to council or file severance applications or consent applications to the township, and they would be reviewed by the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, so the development proposal uh, consists of essentially six waterfront residential lots and uh, essentially a maximum, as shown on the sketch here, potential future lots and additional four lots. So, uh, the redevelopment of this peninsula into 10 single uh, lots that are uh, transferable and uh, would be built with seasonal homes. So the proposal is for seasonal homes. And um, so essentially what occurs here is that um, maybe I'll speak a bit about uh, the adjacent property. So the adjacent property to the, to the east is the Whitewater Village Cottage Club. Uh, it's noted in the report there are seven existing cottages. In fact, there are eight existing cottages. And there is potential for the development of one more. I have been conversing with uh, one owner and I think the president of the Whitewater uh, Cottage Club regarding the development proposal. Um, and they have some expressed some concern with the access and, and we are going to work with them to, uh, to make sure that those concerns are mitigated and dealt with if we move forward with the development proposal. Uh, they, they've uh, they commenced uh, communication with us and that's great. Um, so this peninsula was originally intended to be developed with numerous timeshares. Uh, so the timeshares that are formed part of the Whitewater Village were supposed to extend throughout this entire peninsula. And there would have been almost uh, more or less 19 cottages that would have been built throughout the peninsula. Uh, so as time has progressed, the, uh, uh, the development proposal for those cottages no longer exists and the proponent is seeking to sever lots uh, to be conveyable uh, individually to, to other people for development. Uh, so ultimately at first glance, you notice that from 19 cottages down to 10 lots, there is a decrease in density of the development. Um, so that, that, that needs to be considered as part of this, consider, as part of this proposal. Uh, so staff have reviewed the three proposals from the proponent. I will note that uh, Mr. Kowalski is present today to answer any questions that council may have of him. Um, so I'll just speak uh, with respect to each of, his, each of the, the matters under consideration. So first and foremost, that the development proceed through a severance process. Generally, when council is faced with uh, or staff are faced with development proposals of, of a great number of lots, uh, we would typically steal, steer a developer into a plan of subdivision. Uh, however, in this case, the proposed creation of 10 lots uh, serviced by private, uh, private services does not merit a plan of subdivision application. Uh, this is based on past approvals uh, through the county, through severances and the township. Uh, no proposed public road access, no new public road, municipal road. Uh, the use of the property being seasonal uh, and that all required studies and reports be conducted uh, as conditions of approval for severances. Uh, in relation to the road access, so we're supportive, staff are supportive to proceed with the development through severance process and that would be funneled through the community. Uh, secondly, the road access. So the proposal here is to, to transfer what is termed a fire route. So there is actually a strip of land that runs through this property that is owned by the township and is deemed a fire route. Uh, so this fire route was created back when the uh, Whitewater Village Club was approved. And it would appear that uh, at that time, they were reluctant to approve the development without having a, the property front or have access to a municipal road. So this was a creative approach, maybe we can call it that, to allow the development to proceed. And it seems to function well so far. Uh, the developments proceeded and, and they have access to and from a municipal road, rafting road. Uh, so proposal here is to re, uh, realign this fire route. In fact, transfer the fire route back to the proponent um, and realign the fire route as shown it in yellow. That would be the realignment. And that would be built to a municipal private road standards. So our municipal private road standard uh, was adopted by council in 2019. And the proponent is prepared to uh, to build this section of road to that standard, as well as a, the section of road extending from the 10 lots, this peninsula, all the way back to Rafting Road. If you could scroll down, uh, Carmen, you'll see the other map, I think, is attached to the report. 
you'll notice that the yellow thing continues all the way through wilderness tours or former wilderness tours, all the way back to rafting roads. The proponent is, is prepared to uh, develop a private road, which will be surveyed, which will be designed and built to meet our standard, our municipal private road standard from rafting road all the way in through the development. So currently uh, there's a fire route that doesn't connect to our municipal road. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, if, if we want to call it that. Um, and it, it is accessed through sort of easements through wilderness tours for the, for the Whitewater Village. The staff are supportive of this approach based on past practice. And we want to ensure that uh, any existing owners, the Whitewater Village Club who have access over this strip of land will continue to have access and that this will be built to our, to our standard and, and such. And lastly, uh, staff have reviewed the county official plan, the provincial policy statement, and we have provided a list of studies. So while this list is provided to council and forms part of the motion today, um, uh, these will form part of conditions of approval of the severances. So, um, so, um, the, the, the required studies and reports are not required at the front end of the applications. If council is supportive that this development proceeds through severances, uh, the, app, the proponent could file his applications. Um, and then, uh, which I think he's only proposing the first three or four lots initially. Uh, but, um, but as a condition, we would bring it to committee of adjustment and as a condition of approval, he would be required to do those studies. Um, so I think that summarizes the report, which is a little bit lengthy, and I appreciate your time on that, and uh, I'll be prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Questions, please. Councillor Jackson? Jackson? Yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm in support of this development and this proposal. Um, I think it's a, a great solution to not only uh, developing the property, but finishing off the um, issue of the road. And um, then there will be proper access. I mean, there was access there before, but I, I think this formalizes that access a little bit better than what was there before. Um, as well, with regards to the studies and reports, I did speak with um, Ivan yesterday with regards to those reports. And I would strongly recommend that uh, the Committee of Adjustment review those, um, those reports and studies that are required. And, and Ivan did suggest some of the workarounds for some of them um, and make sure that they put their mind to that whenever it does come in front of them for severances. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Olmstead, then Councillor Okay, Councillor Olmstead, please. Yeah, I completely agree with Councillor Jackson. I think uh, I think this would be a good use of a property. Uh, not too long ago, there was thousands attending these this property every weekend, and for the last two, three, maybe longer years, uh, this property has really been not used. Um, so I, I think this is a good alternative to uh, what the property was being used for. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property. I've been out there numerous times. Uh, there'll be some beautiful, uh, whatever these are, cottages or three season houses or whatever these are gonna be. Um, and again, I agree with Councillor Jackson in that uh, it's, it's gonna fix some issues with respect to roads and uh, clean, clean up some of the um, accessibility issues that, uh, that, that may come down the road if, if we actually don't go ahead with something like this. Um, I also agree that we need to take a good look at these studies and reports. Um, I, I do realize some of them are necessary for, you know, uh, for building or for safety or engineering uh, standards with respect to ensuring that there's water supply and that kind of thing. But I also, as there's been probably upwards of millions of people on this property, or at least a million over the last 40 years, um, I hope we have some consideration that some of these studies may not be required as well, or you know, how, how, how deeply um, we have to dig into some of these, uh, these reports. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay. 
I just wonder them lots. They they're not they don't have uh, they're not on the river. So do they have access through that beach on this picture? So yeah, all all the lots would all well they would generally front on the auto on the Ottawa River. Um, there is perhaps a small strip of land that is owned by, I think it's OPG, but they could cross that OPG portion of land. And if I'm not correct, uh, Mr. Colson, maybe, maybe you can clarify, but these are all waterfront properties. They all have direct access to the water's edge. Maybe it is not, it, perhaps it's not a beach there, but they, uh, they may be considered to have access through the beach, which is just to the sort of east or, or north of the property. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Councillor Nicholson and then Councillor McLaughlin. Okay, Councillor Nicholson, please. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Ivan. Again, uh, innovative way to resolve that fire road challenge that we have. And I like the proposal to keep it to the private road standard. I think that's a reasonable expectation for this number of, of users. And development like this is, in, in my mind, is exactly where we want to go. I just had a, a clarification. Um, in the middle of the report, it talks about uh, private waste water services. I just want to confirm a uh, common language there is that each of these lots is going to have its own septic system and its own well. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So each would be serviced by their individual well and septic. Awesome. Um, the ownership of that private road, can you describe what that ownership would be and and how it uh, continues in, in perpetuity? Yeah, so I guess, I guess the, and I wanted to, to sort of reiterate that is that we, we the white, maybe to start, the Whitewater Village Club clearly has access to their property and we want to make sure that that continues to exist forever and a day and it is retained. Uh, so we are going to work with them to make sure that that, that is outlined, what are their current uh, requirements and such. Um, so what typically happens here is that on a private road, each property that uses the, the road um, would essentially own a portion of the road and there would be agreements in place for the maintenance and use of it. Uh, so as a result of that, again, drafted by lawyers typically, um, there would be specific, specific policies in the, in the agreement that would specify who, who gets to use it, for what purpose, and how the costs are contributed or distributed amongst the property owners or the users. So that's kind of how it would exist. And it would be registered on the title of each of the properties that it affects and would continue forever in a day. In order to remove that from the title, they would require municipal approval because the agreement would be with the township. Does that kind of answer it? No, that's perfect. <laughs> You're well aware, and uh, but I just emphasize it for the members of the public. We have two or three situations here at the other end of the township where the ownership of the road that people live on, the private road, is in question. It's an individual's name, it's in a company name that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and the ownership becomes very foggy. So as long as uh, I'm very much in support, but as long as we can have it very clear and it's not dependent on a company staying in existence or individuals granting people permission. Uh, the next one is just a housekeeping one. And, uh, and I'm noticing it more with in the warm weather, but the recycling and the waste management, uh, when we have a long private road with a number of homes at the end of it, um, it becomes a very much a public, um, it could become a public challenge to have that amount of waste and recycling all at the end of that road where it meets a municipal road. I don't know, it may be something we have to put in the parking lot to discuss at a different time, but how do we make sure that that is, doesn't become a public nuisance or take away from the beauty of, of, of the rest of the area? Um, I was a mechanism, but. Yeah, I would say that through that through the private road or development agreement that would be registered in favor of all the users. Um, we could add terminology perhaps that a struck to be built where this private road connects to an, a nice structure that, 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 that is adequate, that is built uh, within the private road right of way that could house the recycling and garbage perhaps. Uh, so we could perhaps work something out with the developer to see, see if that's, he could accommodate that. And then it would be the responsibility of each of those property owners to maintain it and, and all that in good repair and aesthetically pleasing. 
Um, but we could likely work something. That's a great idea. And we can definitely work that probably into a development agreement with a private road agreement. Yes. Yeah, I think it goes a long way to supporting this this private road initiative that uh, that you're proposing here. At least it'll smooth out those wrinkles. Um, and the last question is just, I understand then that a subdivision um, agreement would normally the way that we would steer people. How, based on this recommendation, how would you, uh, what kind of tests would you apply for other developers in the similar kind of situation? Can you describe that for us at all? Well, and I, I think that the, you know, I'll speak specifically to the to the situation. I guess is you know, we have a we have a, a peninsula here, or a portion of land that was originally planned for development to accommodate numerous numbers of cottages. Um, the development of proposal in this case, which is six lots and potentially ten lots, um, I would say is consistent with past practice. Um, and, and I think that's a crucial thing is, is this exists on Muskrat Lake, this exists on the Ottawa River and other areas. Um, and there's no, uh, no significant <coughs> road or infrastructure being built. I think that's, that's basically, I guess the point, the ideas that, that come across here. Um, again, uh, a plan of subdivision is a very onerous process um, and, and very time consuming um, and very costly. Uh, so while uh, the private road and, and severances may prove to be a, a suitable thing. It may not be suitable in every situation, but in this case, I would say it is suitable uh, on those basis. No, and that's perfect, Ivan. I, and, I, and, I, and I apologize for having to push you into that corner to describe it, but it, it, it just emphasizes that we're trying to be very supportive of this type of development um, in the least onerous way. That puts a little bit more work on your shoulders because you have to make sure that all the checks and balances are in place. But I think in this example, we've achieved that. And I think this is a, is a perfect way to move forward is by individually uh, looking at each case um, and its merits to make that decision. So I think, you've, I, think, I think you've satisfied that and I appreciate very much all the work you put into it. Yeah, Thank you. Maybe, maybe if I could just add to that, uh, Councilor Nicholson, I think, um, I think if in, in the case where there was a development proposal where it wasn't 10 lots and the developer was thinking of developing another 20 lots next to this one, well, then you're into a plan of subdivision. I think the intensity is, is huge. So I think we're kind of, we're, stretched, we're, at, we're at our limit of intensity. So 10 houses, 10 lots is probably, you know, the max, uh, max number there. In my view. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you. Uh, I've been listening to all the comments and I think they're very well uh, done and uh, I appreciate Ivan all his work. I just want to agree with both Councillor Jackson and Councillor Olmstead over the studies that need to be done. I think we need to look at them and uh, with all the traffic that's been on these um, when it comes to a committee of adjustment I think we really need to take a, a firm look at it and uh, see what's needed, what's not. But other than that, I won't go on any further. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Reaver here. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And I'm just in agreement as well with Councillor Jackson, Councillor McLaughlin and uh, Councillor Olmstead. You know, we can get carried away here with some of these, uh, these studies. And uh, I, I do hope that the Committee of Adjustment takes a really hard look at these and see where uh, we might be able to uh, perhaps uh, bypass some of those. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or concerns? <clears throat> see, I see none. Seeing none, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor? Carrie, Carrie. thank you. <clears throat> 6.3, additional building inspection report. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve a contract building inspector slash plans examiner position for a 24 month contract at 1000 hours per year to meet increased demand in building services. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor Olmstead. Councillor Olmstead, thank you. Uh, just go back to Ivan. Yeah, I could, uh, I could introduce the subject matter and uh, Rob, uh, CAO Trombley could assist me. And, and I also have uh, CBO Schultz with us today, uh, tonight, uh, to discuss or answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so essentially, as council is well aware, um, 
with the influx of development we've had over the last couple of years, um, um, there is a, clearly a, an increase in the number of building permits. In fact, even before that, we, we've seen a, a constant increase in the number of building permits in the township. Uh, so there's a, <clears throat> there's definitely a, a greater number of, of building permits being applied for, which is which is great. We are embracing that uh, and we support that. And what we're finding now is that there, there there's a need for support uh, within our building services. Uh, so the report that you have in front of you is recommending that we hire a contract person uh, to meet the existing demand. So the contract position is recommended at this time in order to uh, determine long-term requirements uh, for this service. Um, and, uh, and, and essentially to meet the current volume that we have. Uh, so at this time, we're recommending 1,000 hours. Uh, so this would represent approximately four days a week through the months of April and September, and then two and a half days a week uh, for the other half of the year. Um, so essentially, that's, that's what the report uh, entails. Um, if there's any questions relating to specific number of inspections, uh, number of hours worked and such, I'll be glad to answer them or Doug or Rob. If you want to add anything, feel free, uh, CAO Trumbull. Uh, I just wanted to add that this really flows from your strategic plan that talked about economic development, but one of the key strategies is improving the development process, the approvals process. And we've seen a doubling from 2017 to 2021. And I know, uh, sorry, 2017 to 2020. And so far in 2021, uh, we've hit a number of single detached. So kudos to Doug for keeping up with demand. Um, the other thing I'll just point out is just travel time. So unlike a place like Armpire that has a similar volume of uh, building permits, we have the distances that are involved. So that's an added uh, item. So the contract allows us to kind of really get a sense of what, what this looks like long term. The other thing is we have to go out and recruit and we might have issues recruiting with a contract. Uh, but we think it's a reasonable approach at this time to get somebody in here to get some support. Um, however, as part of the annual budget processes, we would come back to council with uh, see how it's going and if, if we need to change the number of hours or change the status of the job. Um, and so what comes with this is building services should be fu uh, funded through building fees. Um, so what comes with more building permits is building revenue and we need the staff to be able to do that and do the inspections as required in the time required. So I think Doug could... Uh, eloquently speak about it, but this is in line with your strap plan about making sure we're dealing with approvals in as a timely fashion to ensure development is occurring. So I think Doug's the, the, the best verse to just give you an idea of demand at this point and, and then any questions you might have. Well, we've, um, hi everyone. It's been a long time uh, seeing you all at a meeting. Um, it's, it's been, a kind of a wild ride the last three years or four years, uh, going from getting all these building permits uh, coming in at one time, some 12 a day, some 13 a day, and that, and then uh, even the office staff, Debbie is saying, is it ever gonna stop? Um, I don't see it stopping uh, the way the world has changed with people working from home and houses being sold. And, and also now that we've also taken over the consent application, um, um, we are, you know, getting more questions, having to do site visits for severances and, and a bunch of stuff like that also. So um, we're very, very um, busy. Um, you barely get done your inspections a day and you got to input the everything else in the computer the next day just to try to keep ahead. So um, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Show of hands, please. Any questions? Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson, please. Doug, just, uh, I mean, it's clear in my mind that we need, to, we need to invest in your office in order to maintain a certain level of service, which is rightfully so in our, in our strategic plan to support the development. I am just concerned on the, whether or not we're going to be able to keep somebody and retain them. Uh, is, 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 that, is that something that you were going to, we're going to attract someone um, I ho hopefully there's um, some people out there. I think there is uh, people that are that are maybe retiring from other areas um, or, or people that are working part time in other areas right now that we can attract. Um, it's, a, it's for a two year contract or two year term. Um, I think that we will be able to attract somebody. Good. And the other question is, would they I understand the qualification. It was written in the report there. 
they wouldn't be a junior inspector or anything. They would be able to do an inspection in your absence completely, right? Yeah, they, they would have be, yes. The people that we uh, think that's going to fulfill this term will be able to do inspections in, in my absence, yes. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you, Doug. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? Rebrig your place. Thank you, Mayor. Just a quick follow up. This is in addition to um, the casual building inspector that we just hired in April, correct? Uh, with um, uh, Levi Junup. This is in addition to that. So, so let me just explain what we have right now. Right now, we have uh, Erica Mansky. She comes in one day a week in the in the summer, and we have Levi Junup that's doing uh, just part three, uh, uh, which is large buildings. Uh, um, plans examination, and then he comes once in a while to a site. We do all the inspections on the part three buildings. Um, he comes there and he checks out our stuff and, in, and maybe maybe four or five times at the building and just uh, signs off at the end. Um, so we're hoping that by, by getting a, a person um, uh, to fill in at this time, then Erica wouldn't, we wouldn't need Erica to do that, uh, that, that one day a week this would be part of that job. And if we get lucky and find, get somebody that has uh, uh, their, uh, a large building qualifications in it, then we may not need Levi also. But right now we, we are using Levi because his experience and they do that kind of buildings all the time. Very good. Thank you, Doug. And I just wanna add, thank you for all your hard work because I know it's, uh, and Debbie, I know it's been a stressful time, I'm sure uh, throughout. So uh, we do appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? Councillor McLaughlin? Councillor McLaughlin, please. Yeah, I think uh, Reed Regular answered a few of my questions because that was where I was heading as well. Uh, if we're going out looking for somebody, I'd like to see us getting, if we're possible, that they, they have the large. Uh, billing qualifications so we wouldn't need that uh we get rid of those two uh jobs do we, do we need to supply transportation for this applicant um no it's a contract uh, biz, uh, position so we would be paying the mileage we do not have to supply a, a vehicle or anything like that daryl yeah okay. maybe maybe I, if i could just add it's anticipated that the the cost for that would be about $1,500 per year, which is less than the likely payment for an, another vehicle. So yeah, so they would be using their own vehicle and it'd be paid mileage based on the, the rate rate of pay uh, for the town. Okay, so that, that was one of my main questions. One of my questions, Do will they need office space? Um, I think that uh, since we're um, doing our file digit, digitization there now, and um, trying to get our files all into uh, a form of uh, digital, um, we will be able to probably, if things keep going, that we will be have a little bit more room in my office where we could uh, have uh, existing office space. Well, as long as we don't have to expand the office, I'm okay with it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll, we'll try, Daryl. Try, try hard because I know that the, the rafters are starting to bulge. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Clerk, any other questions? I see none. Okay, seeing none at this time, I'll ask for a vote. All in favor? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug. Move on now to 6.4 Arena Parks. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an Arena Parks Operator 3 position as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Operational Review beginning with 2021-2022 ice season. Motion and a seconder, please. And uh, Councillor Nicholson and Councillor Olmstead. Councillor Nicholson, Councillor Olmstead, thank you. And this goes to Jordan. Sorry, Jordan, you're on mute. Oh, my apologies there. 
All right, thank you. So I think just with um, interest in time and with this report, uh, what I'd really like to do is, is start with some of the, the key highlights. And I think the, the first uh, thing to start with here is, um, is taking a look at our Parks and Recreation Operational Review. And in that review, it actually recommended increasing staffing capacity of full-time employment. And this simply was to, to address our operational requirements. And you know, with that, um, kind of leads into our recruitment for, for seasonals and qualified staff. This is something that has been coming, uh, becoming you know, increasingly difficult, and it's harder and harder to find these people who are willing to work part-time. And just to give you an idea, when we transitioned into arenas in, um, in 2017, um, you know, we had close to a, a dozen um, operators uh, that were working in the arenas. As of last year, uh, we had two. So th this is something, like I said, it has been becoming increasingly difficult and uh, it's getting harder to, to secure staff. Uh, on top of this, as everyone knows on council, um, you know, we did lose a, a long time employee and uh, this employee was extremely instrumental to our operations. And, you know, I, I just I can't speak highly enough about him. And, um, you know, Mel actually worked between 30 and 40 hours uh, when we had um, ice in at the, the Westmeath Arena. Um, something else I also want to note, too, is when we take a look at our 2021 budget. Um, when we when we budgeted for arenas, uh, council had committed to, to have three arenas open for the fall. Um, so right now, when we take a look at what's going on with COVID, um, we are the province is getting their their vaccinations. It's looking like um, you know the, the province has a, an opening plan. So by the fall, um, we do anticipate having three arenas open, and um, you know we'd like to have the appropriate amount of staffing uh, to do this. Um, something else too. If, if you take a look down in the report, um, I provided um, uh, some comparisons here. And, and these comparators, actually, they came from our ops review. And when you take a look at it, you'll see the, the Whitewater region. So right now, we currently only have three time uh, full-time staff that operate in the arenas. And as we all know, we have three arenas to operate. And when we take a look at our neighboring municipalities who have one through two arenas, um, you'll notice that their staffing complement is anywhere between 10 and 18. Um, so, you know, this, this is something that's really critical to our operations as well. And just in addition to that, um, if you take a look at our FTE, so this is our full-time equivalent comparison, um, you'll see that the value, so keep in mind, this is for uh, casual or, or part-time seasonal work for operators one and two, um, equal a value of 5.3. So again, we have three full-timers. Uh, we are looking to get that fourth to, to hopefully ensure that, um, you know, some if not all operations will be uh, started up this fall. And, um, and move on from there. So I think what we'll do right now is we'll, we'll scroll down in the report to the financial implications. And I know uh, in discussions with uh, Treasurer Crozier, um, we talked a lot, about, um, uh, a lot about these numbers. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass over to Sean so he can explain to, to council where our numbers are coming from. All right, thanks, Jordan. Um, so the cost in 2021, of the new position uh, or the potential new position uh, is in, in and around $26,000. Uh, the implication for Whitewater Region really is about 15,500. Uh, basically, uh, there's $10,500 that um, is being replaced. That was what the uh, former uh, operator two uh, position, uh, that would have been their roughly their um, salary and, and uh, other costs of payroll deductions. Etc. cetera. Um, and then the annual cost for the position uh, is about 77.5 and being replaced of that is uh, again, that operator two hours, which is about 27.5 and then a summer student position at about $10,000. So the annual implication uh, is about $40,000. So um, yeah, I think it's important to note is, uh, yeah, it's a new position, um, but it's replacing essentially pretty much a full-time winter position. Um, the operator too, Mel, he pretty much was a full-time position um, other than when it got to non-ice season, uh, then he, he was in a full-time position. But for the ice season, especially at Westmeath, he was relied upon heavily and put in a lot of time there. So it's replacing that, but then it's also adding support uh, to the parks, um, the parks operation in, in non-ice season. Uh, so yes, it is a, a position, but it's also replacing um, a lot of hours at the arena and then also one summer student position as well. So but an, an estimated annual annual implication of 40,000 uh, and for 2021, 
fifteen five. Um, yeah, I will pass it. Uh, I think Jordan, you, you want to pass it back to the chair at this point for any questions, or do you have any? Yeah, we'll pass it back to the chair uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, clerk, see questions. Uh, Councilor Jackson, please. Councilor Jackson, please. Um, it's really hard to compare the staff complement. I guess my question is specifically the numbers that you're comparing with the staff complements of the city of Pembroke, town of Empire, and town of Renfrew. Are they just for arena, arena um, services or are they for a swimming pool, um, all the parks that they have, uh, tennis courts, et cetera? Or is it just strictly for the arena? That's one question I have. Perhaps I'll get that answered first. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, so it is it is their full-time uh, complement. So if there is a, a swimming pool there and there's a full-time staff person, then yes, they would be uh, incorporated into the, the, the staff and complement. Okay, because I find it very hard um, to compare municipalities to municipalities unless they are in similar situations. I agree that um, obviously three full-time running three arenas is very difficult um, to deal with. However, I also want to make sure that do these uh, staff have particular hours? In other words, office staff work from 8.30 to 4, Monday to Friday. Um, are, these, are they just restricted to the number of hours um, for the week and um, from Saturday to Sunday? and they work any of the hours that are requested or are we looking at overtime hours as well? Um, so just so I understand this question, um, so you're just looking at what we currently have right now? What, what are the hours that they currently work? Do they work Monday to Friday? Do they work um, a set number, uh, a set time period? In other words, uh, nobody's at the arena during the day. Most of the work is at night. Um, what are these full-time hours? What are their hourly days? Right. So when, when we're in ice season, uh, typically it's, it's mostly evenings and weekends. Um, we do have maintenance days that we um, book into our, our facilities around uh, ice bookings. Um, so we will have those as day shifts. We do have some uh, daytime bookings. Uh, this past year has been a little different because of COVID. When we move into the parks, uh, we, we, work, we work seven days a week. We have a shift on every single day. Uh, right now, our, our um, park attendant complements are on the weekends and our full-timers work Monday through Friday and it's a day shift. So it's just to add, it's 40 hours each. And as Jordan has put out, shifted. So they can, they'll work weekends and they'll work evenings and it's, it's 40 hours. So they're not, they're not like roads, which would be Monday to Friday, they'll they'll take shifts based on ice demand in the winter and then the, the summer shifts. Okay, because I, I think that's important as well for the public to note that um, if they're working at night, then they're working their shift and not necessarily overtime. And, and um, sorry to interrupt, just to give you an idea too. So in, in the heart of the winter, when all three arenas are open on a typical year and COVID isn't in the mix, um, you know, we typically see seven shifts alone in the arenas uh, just on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, so, I mean, when you have like our full time uh, staffing complement are working those as well. And then we also have our, our Monday through Friday. So we potentially in the week time in, uh, in, uh, from Monday through Friday, uh, we could have uh, 15 shifts. So there's there's quite a bit of different um, shifts going on in all three different arenas. So when you start to calculate those things, um, you know we're really spreading our staff out in, in different locations um, and at different times throughout the week as well. Yes, and I guess the other question I have, Jordan, is this specific staff going to be designated to an individual arena, or are they going to be floating? And maybe the broader question is: is do they all float between the arenas as required? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So no, they won't be stationed in one, one arena. Um, you know, the biggest thing is, is that if council approves this and we go out to recruitment, it's really going to depend on how much experience that person has as well, right? So we want to make sure that they're um, trained kind of within our guidelines and whatnot, and to make sure that they are trained in different facilities so that they can flow from facility to facility. Because the other thing that we have to keep in mind here too is that uh, right now while we're operating with uh, the staffing that we have, 
Um, you know, touch wood, we've been really thankful that no one's been sick or injured or anything that's that's taken them away from their job. So if all of a sudden something like that had happened, um, we have to be able to have that backfill and we have to be able to have these um, operators trained in different facilities to, to be able to make sure that we, we get them in there and uh, we serve the public, so. All right, thank you, Jordan. No problem. Any other questions? Councillor Mackay? So what will you do with this man in the summer? So um, as to what the, the report speaks to is, is basically what we're looking at right now. I do apologize. The sun's kind of coming into my window. I might be a little hard to see, but um, anyhow, the, uh, in, in the report, it does speak about dropping a, a, a summer student. So right now what we do, we have a crew that operates uh, seven days a week. And that crew is made up of uh, three operator threes and three summer students. So what we would do is we would drop that student and then we would backfill it with uh, this current position that we're looking to, uh, to recruit for. Just yep. add, I would just add if it can is you have three boat launches, parks, playgrounds, two beaches, maybe a third. <laughs> um, all the I think Jordan has said to me there's about 40 locations for grass cutting. So there's a lot of level of service in the summer as much as there is with the three arenas in the winter. So we're going to lose a student um, and then basically have two full times for each of the crews. My understanding from Jordan is they kind of have uh, crews working throughout the week of seven days, but then also geographically cutting the grass and getting to all these, these facilities that we have across the expanse of Whitewater region is also an, another consideration. So they'll be as busy in the winter as they are in the summer. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you. Uh, my, my question to Jordan is, that that salary that you showed us does that include benefits? Uh, yes, it does. If I'm not mistaken, and perhaps um, our treasurer can jump in here if I'm if I'm saying that wrong, but I do believe it's it's the entire cost of a staff person. Okay, yes, because... that's well. Sorry, sorry, Councillor. Uh, no, no, go ahead. No, I need clarification. Um, yeah, so I calculated that with the the statutory deductions. Um, and the information we have for benefits, at, oh, I did I just go blank? Uh, the information we have for benefits at this time. Okay, I, I, I understand some of it. Other parts are going, whoa, like, I don't know, you're taking away a student's job. That, that I don't like, because students need summer employment. I, I wonder is, if you can't find people to work in your arena, would it be better to up the rate for the arena operators to kind of entice more people in there? Arena operators don't get benefits. Am I correct on that one? Uh, one and twos do not. And, yeah. and, maybe, and maybe I can take this. So we have three job descriptions involving kind of arenas and parks. So arena operator threes do both parks and arenas. Uh, twos and ones just do arenas, but all three jobs have been evaluated and, and um, for the grid. And I would say that the, the remuneration for those positions are generally competitive. Um, the issue we have in recruiting someone is a full-time job. So the issue with seasonals is how many hours can we guarantee them? So basically we want the seasonals to fill in the gaps. So to Jordan's point about, we have them for 40 hours, we use the full-timers and then the gaps we fill with seasonal. Um, so that's one thing. From a student perspective, it's just, we wanna make sure that if we have the full-time person in the arenas, we utilize them in the summer. We're hopeful for next summer, once COVID is done, you'll recall we used to have students for beach the beach programs and that hasn't occurred for two years and also the tourism kind of side of things and the van sand coming in so we're hopeful that um, although we'll lose one in parks and be down to two that hopefully the beach program is back up and they can maintain the washrooms there instead of the park staff and the raking of the beaches and the maybe a tourism student that can have a, help at Veterans Memorial Park and help the volunteers at the tourist booth so hopefully COVID's behind us so yes we'll lose the summer soon but we're hopeful that those programs that we've traditionally had for students in the parks and recreation field generally can come back in future years subject to budget and grant applications uh, for the summer student programs. 
I, I, I just have a hard time. Uh, I, I don't know. I know this year we had three full-time staff and one arena. That's what we had. Um, I, I just don't, I can't get it in my mind why there's, there's so many retired people. Would they not be interested in doing some of this in the evenings just to, for something to do? I think you could recruit that way rather than looking at more full-time staff. If I was doing more full-time staff, I, I think it would be more beneficial maybe for some, for an extra road crew operator. Uh, I, I just can't see this, but that's that's just my mind. I'm one person, and uh, I, I I I can't. You need to try and convince me. Maybe I'm not going to try to convince you, but I could just add: we go every year to try to get seasonals. So, and maybe twice or three times in the ice season, and it's it's difficult to get qualified people. And these people need to be trained, right? Because we're dealing with, it's not just a simple job. So we've had recruitment and retention issues from that perspective. I understand where you're coming from, um, but I just wanted to note that it's increasingly difficult to get qualified uh, people that can do this type of work, but also keeping them uh, because we're not the only arena in town. And to your point, we have three people full-time for one arena and we're going back to three arenas. So um, maybe. Well, there, it's in the budget. Uh, it's been budgeted and council has said yes, but council can always cut the service level. So th I think this comes down to what's your desired level of service? And in roads, for instance, we have 12 people. So what we're recommending here is four in parks and recreation based on the level of service. So the, the real kind of nuts and bolts of this is which services the council want to set the level of service. So if you don't want us to close, if you want us to not maintain a park or not maintain a beach or close an arena or really reduce its hours, that's your decision to make. That is in the municipal act in terms of your responsibilities as determining level of service. And then basically staffing and equipment and all that comes with that based to make sure you, you set a level of service and staff, we make sure that we're meeting that level of service. So I'd say this is to make sure we're meeting the, the projected level of service that you've determined. So um, I, get, I, I get your concerns, um, but what I would say is, if you don't want the full-time staff, then you have to make some tough decisions and start closing things, and we haven't uh, been doing that. Yeah, I, I just look at the dollars. That's, that's where I come from, Rob. I'm sorry, I, I seem to be one that wants to look at the dollars. And, and this, and I understand the service. If you don't put the dollars out, the service goes down. I, I understand some of that. I just think that there may be some other ways of doing this, but I'm only one person. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Clerk. Other questions? Councillor Nicholson and then Councillor Jackson. Okay, Councillor Nicholson, please. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so when I, when I read these reports and that operational review that was done, the first thing that comes to mind is just how important volunteers must have been for this township to survive with three arenas and all of the facilities that we were running before they started to amalgamate under the township. I can't imagine, and, and I only have exposure at one of the facilities really for managing volunteers and the amount of volunteer hours that have gone into this must have been incredible for that to be maintained. So I acknowledge that uh, for the level of service that we're demanding is provided from the recreation department, um, I can acknowledge that we need to increase the full-time staff. Um, and, and that provides us you know, continuity and all of those efficiency aspects the treasurer loves to see. Um, I do wonder, Jordan, from a question perspective, a question is the, uh, you're going to have four level threes. Uh, so four guys at the same level. Uh, is there going to be one guy paid more as a supervisor or how are you going to manage chain of command with those four guys or are they just all equals? Um, so basically they're all equals. Um, there's going to be, uh, you know, different shifts provided in, in all of the arenas. And um, 
And yeah, essentially they're, they're all in the same, there's a, there's a, a solid grid of course, and it speaks to that in the report. And um, you know, depending on where each individual is at, there is a potential to move up on the grid, um, but all threes would, would cap out at the same, same salary. Sorry, I don't know if I froze or you froze, Jordan, but if you can just talk, repeat what you said just after you started talking about grid. Sure, yeah, I was just saying that, um, you know, if we take a look at the salary grid, so there is a, a grid there, and, and just depending on where each uh, staff person is at, um, they have the potential to move up on the grid. And at some point in time, if you're at your job rate, um, you're essentially all operator threes will be paid the same. Okay, good. And, and I, I just have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, just in the short period of time that I've been kind of following council issues. I mean, we've increased uh, Little Lakes into a fully functioning beach operation, essentially, um, with its own set of washrooms and stuff. And, and I see the creep. I mean, look out, we've now redone and, and we're managing that and, and, and the boat launches. I'm loath to, to increase staff, um, but in this situation, I don't see how we can get around it unless we decide not to keep something open this summer or this fall. And I'm not prepared to make that decision not to provide that level of service yet. For not making that decision, it comes with a cost, and that's the cost of hiring. That's my thoughts on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson. So two very important things were said. Um, one by the CAO, if we're willing to um, have this level of service being provided to the township. Um, I don't know that we fully reviewed um, what kind of level of service that we're prepared to do. I know that there always has been, you know, certain talk about um, do we need three arenas? Do we, you know, um, those types of questions similar to do uh, the questions that were provided, um, do we need the five fire halls, which I know we've resolved that we do. I don't know that we have resolved the question about the three arenas and what that impact as far as asset management, uh, making sure they're maintained to their level um, and so on and so forth. And when I think most of, if not all of the um, buildings are certainly at their um, estimated useful life. Um, they're certainly close, if not uh, beyond that. And then the other question is, um, if we are going to review that, and if we have said, yes, we want to do that service today, and if we're going to review that at some point, should we be hiring a contract person rather than a full-time? Because I hesitate to have a payout at the end of all this, um, if in a year's time we decide that, no, we don't need one of the full times because we're reducing our service or reducing a rink or whatever that portion is. And I guess my question is, are we jumping the gun right now? Is it required for the summer? And I know at some point, these three staff members that are currently working for us do get vacation and to go down to two uh, staff members while another one is on vacation is becomes very difficult to run three arenas. I get that. Um, and all of the, the parks in the summer. So I guess that is, that is one of my questions. Are we jumping the gun to go full-time with benefits or should we go to a similar type of thing um, you know, a contract position for a year, um, figure out where council is, is satisfied at what level of service we're gonna provide, how many arenas we're going to back, um, make sure that that is set in stone moving forward before we actually hire a full-time position. And perhaps, you know, Rob, you can maybe speak to this with regards to, um, how that would work if we had decided, you know, to go to two arenas or one arena or whatever, whatever that's going to be. I'm not suggesting that I'm in favor of one or the other or three or anything uh, at this point, but I think at some point uh, we do need to, you know, fully understand that uh, cost factor to the municipality 
especially when we're adding another staff member. Just a thought. So we did we did consider that, I should say. Um, Jordan's kind of was losing patience with me because we were flipping around on how, how, will we, how we can make this happen. Uh, so the operational review said, look at adaptive reuse for one of the arenas and they recommended that the best candidate to look at based on kind of the structure itself is Westmeath. So that doesn't mean that the arena gets demolished and doesn't get used. It just means it wouldn't have vice. So then you'd, you'd still have some form of building to maintain and maybe a program to support. And when we did the full-time equivalent stats, which is your full-time hours plus your casual together, I know Councillor Jackson knows that, but just for everybody on, on, on the call, um, Cobden for Arena Ice was kind of in the range of 2.25. Um, and then to support Beachburg was 1.75 and it was uh, just short of, of one. So even just based on basic service and hours with the three arenas, you're, in, you're exceeding four. So just, just based on demand for ice and maintenance, let alone uh, we're talking about maybe we were directed to look at Green Lake as a potential beach and we're adding a parquet um, and we're, we're being asked to maintain kind of better maintain the boat launches and other things. So in my mind, while we did consider a contract, we think to, to attract somebody that's qualified full-time is, is better. And I think there would have to be a real decrease uh, both winter and summer that we wouldn't even need them. So that's why we, we, we made the recommendation for four. And you made a good point about the comparators and how do we compare. Um, but four is nowhere near where any of those uh, other municipalities are. Uh, and then one I know to our east that's getting an additional pad. So it's the staff numbers are likely gonna go up. So we, we looked at it from that perspective and feel that based on kind of the level of service over probably the next five years, unless we're making real drastic changes in levels of service, four is supportable. And what, what would uh, ebb and flow, I think is the uh, operator one and two positions, the, the seasonal casual ones. Um, where that would help us meet demand as, a, uh, as demand might increase or go down. Um, and then he also in the summer, we would use students to help depending on the programs that the council decided to do. So that's why we landed on this. Uh, Jordan it was tasked also to come back on the operational review with um, kind of how we're gonna address some of the recommendations in there. Uh, the asset management plan does include um, the data we got on the asset management side. I think that's a, an important consideration as well in cost. Um, and the Westmeath Recreation Task Force is looking at kind of because they, they were the ones with the recommendation to look at adaptive reuse in Westmeath for the ICE facility. So that work's going to happen as well. But I would say to get below four full time, you would have to do more than just take the ice out of an arena. You'd have to make some other big changes uh, to get there. So we did consider that. It's always an option, though. And then one more further question. When we look at staffing complement, we haven't looked at what those comparables that you've come up with, what those comparables um, have for part-time staff or rink rats, you know, they're often referred to. Um, how many do they have to do that? And how many students do they have in the summertime for the recreation as well? I think that needs to be compared as well. Maybe we need to step up our game um, as far as um, making sure that those are offset as well. And does it eliminate the full-time position? I don't know. Um, does it make it more uh, in line with a, a full-time part-time without benefits? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm overall three quarters convinced that we need a new, another person, but I'm not at a hundred percent yet because of all these other factors that are in play um, that could come at any point in time over the next year or so. And especially not knowing uh, during COVID what's happening. Um, I know we're hoping that it's going to open um, this fall, but if it doesn't open, what are we doing with, not only the three recreation, and I understand that it still has to be maintained to some extent, but certainly not to the extent um, when it's fully open. And um, 
so those are the questions that I have right now. And it, it's very frustrating. I know it's frustrating for everybody involved. Um, but there are a lot of questions that go unanswered, unfortunately. Yeah, and I should just point out that that data came from Dylan Consulting. So it wasn't us that pulled those numbers together. So it came from them. And the report was very, the operational review was very clear that we needed to get all that benchmarking data, but also for us to price out, hey, they're cutting grass in Beechburg and then they go to Westmeath. Well, that's 10 to 14 kilometers. So how much time are they losing to travel time and a bunch of other things? Um, but this recommendation is really not about like in building, keeping up with demand. It's basically saying based on what you say to us now to keep open or to open uh, when we have three, uh, the likelihood of us only opening one, I think is slim. And the likelihood of us closing an arena in the next 18 months, I would say is slim to none. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. Uh, but I think the fourth supports current level of service. Um, and probably if there's any adjustments to the level of service, I think less than four would be major service cuts um, would be my, my take on it. But I appreciate where the counselor is coming from. I know you tasked me in my um, in the departmental work plan and some of my brought forward is benchmarking, key performance indicators, statistics, that kind of stuff. So as we've corrected a bunch of other things, I think that will be helpful for the public, but also council in terms of what are we actually providing from a service level per perspective and what does that mean? Lane kilometers, uh, a bunch of data that we can monitor and track and then also properly benchmark to others because it's hard to benchmark with people in Renfrew County because they're either really small or really big and we're kind of stuck in the middle of a rural municipality with a high level of service like urban services and parks and recreation but then on the roadside very rural large expanses of, of road to maintain so we've got both it's a double whammy but I, I, I understand uh, that the comments from councillors McLaughlin and Jackson. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> Clerk, see any other questions? No. No. Uh, wait, I, Councillor McLaughlin, do you maybe? Yeah. I, I just, when, when I'm listening to Councillor Jackson, I kind of have to agree with what Councillor Jackson's saying that maybe rather than going trying to recruit full time, is try and find somebody for a contract to see if this is really needed. I, I just have a big problem. I mean, I go back a long time ago when the three arenas were ran with $30,000. That's what they got. They got 10,000 each one of them. Um, and I understand, I just have a big problem. This is just getting larger and larger and larger. And I guess maybe we need to look at our cost of service. Where, where does the public want us? Because it's easy, it's simple. Just, you want that line, that much service, then you, you have to spend that much money. So that, that's where my comment, I, I like the idea of maybe doing slow steps and uh, seeing if we couldn't find somebody who would uh, be willing to take on a contract rather than hiring full time. And then we turn around and we have to, we have all the benefits and everything else that goes with it. But that, that's my last comment. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other? No. Okay, so we will stick with the original um, motion which was Whitewater Region approve an Arena Parks Operator 3 position as, a recommended, rec as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Operational Review beginning with the 2021-22 ice season. So we're voting on that. All in favor. Can I, can I ask a question there first? Sorry, being, oh, nobody sorry. saw my hand. Um, In your hand. Sorry, uh, just Mayor, as, as we were going through the Westmeath Recreation um, uh, task force right now. I, I wonder if, if if this is something we can put off. And I'm, I'm please, if anybody's watching the video, I'm not suggesting this hinges on Westmeath or not. But I think a lot of good good information might come from this task force that uh, we meet every second 
I think every second Wednesday or every, I can remember, I, we've had one meeting so far, I'm just not sure how many times we were, we were scheduled to meet. So maybe Rob could add something to that. Rob, do you think that would, that would help give any insight into this position? Well, I think we've had one meeting and I think they made it pretty clear that they weren't very happy with the recommendation to get rid of their ice. <laughs> and I don't think they're recommending that we're going to change anything. I think they're going to re be recommending how we go about refreshing our boat launches and our playground. I'm not saying they want us to spend more money, but I didn't hear and I don't anticipate they're going to be talking about reduction in service. Um, the other thing I should say is if we don't do this now, the danger is ice goes in in August and September and we don't have the staff to put it in or to maintain. So that's the only reason why we're bringing it now. And if you don't, and the question is, if you don't, then then we come back to you and say, hey, we can't we can't keep up because Maldahan in the, in the West Mead, like a lot of our seasonal hours were really Mel um, working full time and then we don't have them. And I think the other part of about recruitment is we recruit two, three times in a winter season to get arena operators. We're not getting them. And we, we've done the compensation review. We've evaluated those jobs. Those jobs are competitive. So we're only recommending this because we feel that it's in keeping with the ops review that the province paid for. So the province paid us to do this operational review and it recommended a full time. So that's why we're here. <clears throat> but I don't anticipate Westmeath will say, oh, you can save a couple in Westmeath or they'll necessarily, what we heard is how dare you recommend potentially not having ice in Westmeat, then we basically said, well, no, this is for us to have a conversation to engage on what you view recreation to be here long term and where you see investments being focused in, in, in that area because they were specifically mentioned in the report that Dylan did. Um, so I, just if that helps, but my indication from, day, from meeting one was not that they were looking to, uh, to any reduction in service. Can you and Jordan open your crystal ball to see if we're going to be allowed into arenas in September? Is there any indication that we won't be allowed into arenas? Um, so the only thing that I received uh, when I spoke to the health unit at the end of uh, ice season was be prepared to operate the same way for the fall time. And that was the message that was, was given to us. And, you know, I, I think, uh, and ju just a note on that with our operational plan, um, you know, that had changed about four times throughout the year. And every time it changed, it was for the better and for the good. Um, so I think we've gotten to a point where, you know, we we do allow people into the facility. Uh, people are using the change rooms, you know, those kind of things. So as long as everything still seems to open up and keeps on getting better, uh, I think we'll be in a good position for the fall time. And, and just to add to that, I don't think that means we would be down to one facility. It would mean that any facility that's open is kind of, olden days pre-COVID plus the COVID requirements and limitation smaller groups, which means you've got to spread them out. So that's the one thing we're going to have to deal with is we might have the restrictions on top of trying to get back to normal, but also based on the phase plans, phase three and even phase two, based on the timing the government has kind of laid out, it seems that by at least mid to late fall, things might be um, back. And that's why we're, we're, and to Jordan's credit, he's planning, he's been planning about how August and September and October look uh, and making sure we're ready to go. From a business standpoint, I, I have to add, it is so much easier operating your business with full-time staff than students and part-time staff and trying to get people on the same page and uh, any safety issues or training or it, it's just, the list goes on and on and on the, the stumbles. So. I, I completely get it for sure. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So we'll go back to the motion. The motion, Councillor McLaughlin. Just to get it clear in my head, you were talking about ice times. Uh, and I understand, I think the ice in Cobden goes in late August, is that correct? And then, we're going to put, are we putting the ice in Beechburg for uh, summer hockey or early hockey? So is plan is, you know? yeah, I can, I can provide you an update. The plan right now is um, uh, we typically have our first ice in Cobden, uh, middle of September. So that's going to be our starting point. And then what we want to do is we want to be able to stagger the ice. Uh, so the next one that would follow would be Beechburg, approximately 14 days later. 
And then again, approximately 14 days later after that, uh, open up Westmeath. So that's kind of the plan for fall. I, I thought Westmeath ice never went in until about December. No, Westmeath ice always went in. It, we always had ice the Tuesday after the long weekend in October. So just depending on when that falls. Uh, but we also okay. have to keep in mind, um, just with uh, with the plant operations getting ice in, it's it's um, uh, quite the process. So we just want to make sure that we can stagger them to make sure we have ice. Okay, I, I'm I, I'm finished. I I just asked for a recorded vote before we decide to do this. Okay, um, uh, Clerk, you want to run a recorded vote? Okay, so um, the first person will be our mover, um, Councillor Nicholson. Uh, sorry, Carmen, I think it has to be the requester of the recorded vote. Oh, and, my apologize. Yeah, and yeah, then you yeah. can go alphabetical with um, the Reeve and the mayor going last. It's supposed to be the horseshoe, but oh yeah, we don't have a horseshoe. But the requester for the recorded vote first, and the mayor, and the, the Reeve and the mayor last, and the in between. Just bear with us; it's online. <laughs> so. Um, uh, Councilor McLaughlin? Nay. Uh, Councilor Jackson? Nay at this time. Councilor McLaughlin? Uh, sorry, Councilor Mackay, I, I apologize. It's, their names are up and down beside each other, so. Uh, I think I'm going to have to say nay. Uh, um... Councillor Nicholson. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's okay. Councillor Nicholson. I'm in favor. Councillor Olmstead. In favor. Reeve Regear. In favor. And uh, Mayor Moore. In favor. So we have four, four, and three against. So motion is carried. Is it carried, Rob? Yeah. I can't do the math in my head. Oh, thank God. Good job, Carmen. Recorded Thanks. votes are fun, even and, and even worse on Zoom. So it's as recorded, and I and I double counted. Uh, so I have it as well. So we're good. Uh, Fifty plus one. <laughs> yeah, you're good. So, Mr. Mayor, I don't know. We we got a lot done, but I don't know if now's a good time for a short a short recess. If people need a a, a slight bio break. Do we want to break or nay? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. I see one. Yes. So yes, we'll take seven yeah. minutes, please. And you can turn your camera off. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Turn your mics off, please. Seven minutes.
Jordan, are you still on? Yes, I am. Um, can I make maybe a suggestion sure. that um, I know Opiongo High School has been very good wow. at teaching life skills to uh, kids. I know when our youngest son went there, they had an agriculture, anyways, a program that taught them a number of different things. It gave them chainsaw license, first aid, um, oh God, a number of things. They were the ones that built a shed. They got to learn how to do um, surveying and there, it, it was quite the thing. And I don't know if maybe we could approach them and to see if they were interested in finding out, um, I don't know if an uh, arena, um, how to make ice or whatever, whatever the level one is for, um, you know, for students to be able to work at the arenas, because not only would whitewater benefit, but I would think that um, uh, Bonisher Valley uh, stat, like they would benefit from it as well, having some students trained in that. And, and you don't recall the name of that program, eh? Like it's a, it was a, like just well, like a life skill? Well, it was a specific program. Oh, okay. Um, and it didn't, uh, it, it, it gave them a, an actual certificate of, at the end of it. I don't know that um, it, uh, it would be another offering. It wouldn't attach to that one. I don't know if they've continued it, but maybe it's something that we could offer students you know, and even if I don't know to get somebody in to train them to do that level one so that you can get um, some part time staff in at, you know, grade 11 or 12. I don't know. It's just a suggestion that I. That's great. Yeah. To get I'll look into it see if it's, uh, it's still offered. Can, can I? Well, and I don't think it, it matters if it's offered or not. I think um, if we could see if they're interested in um, maybe and Bonisher Valley going together, if we paid for it and see if some of the students are interested in getting trained on it um, to become, um, you know, a, a student at the arenas. Right. And just yeah. to add to that, Charlene, um, I know as of uh, three, four years ago, uh, actually two years ago, they were still offering that kind of, I know what you're talking about. I can't think of the name of the program, but yeah, they were taking chainsaw license, getting chainsaw and uh, getting their and sprayer, yeah. sprayer license. I'm not sure what the name of it was, but that program was being offered at Opiongo. You're correct about that. It's still being offered. And I think it's through careers. Yeah. And so it, did, it would be so helpful. Did you have to? So it was it was a program then, like they took it as a semester or something. Is that the way it works? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I know they have an outdoor arena out there that was built by the students. So um, they bought they got money for the fu original funding. I know Kyle was involved in the original um, course that was offered out there and they got a, it's not a bulldozer, <laughs> a backhoe, a backhoe I'm pretty sure. And they learned how to dig posts, like post holes and stuff like that because they set the posts for the outdoor arena mm -hmm. and they built the shed. Um, so they had to survey and do all of that stuff. Um, and level it um, so that they could house the um, backhoe and stuff like that. And the snow blower was attached wow. so that like it, it, it truly was an amazing and, and for some boys that don't really like school, mm -hmm. um, that kind of hands on program um, was amazing for those kids. I mean, it was truly amazing. Wow, that is that sounds like an awesome course, honestly. Like, yeah. Okay. Wow. If 
Councillor Mackay, Councillor Nicholson, Councillor Olmstead. We're just waiting. We have a quorum, but. Oh, and just a note, there's a fire, a house fire in Whitewater Region down off of Fott Road, I believe. Oh dear, that's not good. <clears throat> yeah, I've been informed by the, the fire chief that it's all hands on board. It's fully engulfed corner view area. So if there's any updates, I'll share them. But um, I asked them to stay safe as, as normal. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, do we have quorum now, clerk? Yeah. Okay, so we'll move on to 6.5, Parks and Rec. <clears throat> Lawn Tractor 2021-18. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region, one award a tender 2021-18 to Huckabone Equipment for the purchase of Parks and Recreation Lawn Tractor, and two, in addition to the approved capital amount of $10,000 for park equipment, Approve an additional amount of $7,553.64 from recreation reserves to cover the additional cost for a total purchase of $17,553.64, include HST rebate. Motion in the seconder, please. Councillor Olmsted, Councillor Mackay. Councillor Olmsted, Councillor Mackay, thank you. And this goes to Jordan, please. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I guess what I'd like to start off is just, uh, I try, I'll try to keep this report uh, shorter than the last one. Um, and I'd just like to um, point out a few highlights in this report. And one of the, the first things is um, understanding that this piece of equipment would actually replace the, uh, the 1993 uh, Kubota, um, which of course is well past its uh, life expectancy at this point or its life cycle. Um, so I did want to point that out. It is in the report, I do know, um, but that's something really important that council should be aware of. The second thing is, is that, um, you know, we, we took a considerable amount of time um, to, to look at and understand what it is that we need to purchase for, for parks at this point in time. And when we were going through a lot of this, you know, we had identified a few things. And, and one of the things is uh, slope concerns. And, and you may not realize it, but we have over 40 cuts uh, throughout the region. And uh, there are quite a, quite a few hilly areas or even uh, reasonable slopes that um, just a regular um, a zero turn may not be actual, actually to, to handle. Uh, so that was something that we did identify. The second thing is, is our ROP, so rollover protection. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these, these type of, of equipment um, um, are not an aftermarket part. So they actually are sold on commercial as well as uh, industrial pieces of equipment. Um, the third thing that we that we considered as well as our pan size. So currently right now um, with our, our zero turn, we have a 60 inch uh, pan size. And while, yes, it's, it's extremely uh, good for uh, ball diamonds and those kind of flat surfaces, uh, we want to go something that uh, wasn't chewing up the ground uh, on slope. So if you can imagine a five foot width um, pan, uh, it's chewing up one side of the grass while maintaining the other. So we wanted to go something that was reasonable and could get into these areas. And I think the, the last point and the most important thing was um, uh, looking at a four wheel drive and why this is really important is because with many of the slopes and I can even use the, the Cobden Park here in town uh, as an example, if you're, if you're driving the uh, zero turn, which is a, a two wheel drive piece of equipment and you get to the end of a hill, um, and there could be additional slopes and whatnot. There's no room to turn. You can't turn around. With a four-wheel drive, we can get into those places. We can actually cut vertically on, on certain slopes, um, go back and forth and in and out of job. So this really saves additional trimming. Um, as you may or may not be aware, trimming just, just never goes away, um, as well as, um, as um, uh, cutting the grass with a, with a push lawnmower. So I think uh, just moving down to when we take a look at, at the quotes here, um, you'll notice... Um, we did receive one quote, and so this was from Huckabones Equipment, and this is actually also a local business. And I, I, should, I should note that everything was issued and tendered uh, on Bedingo as well as our website as well. Um, so if, if you wouldn't mind, Carmen, if you can just scroll down to the financial part of it. Um, I'll just skip on down there if it's okay with everybody. 
Um, you'll, you'll notice here that we have the cost laid out for the, the uh, lawn tractor. And uh, when you take a look, the HST rebate is included in there. And we have a total of $17,553 and 64 cents. Um, so that's where we're kind of standing. And that's where, um, you know, with this piece of equipment, I think that's going to be really useful. It's also going to be efficient for us. And again, it's going to be replacing that 93 Kubota. So uh, upon approval of council, um, that's the direction that we're going. What we'd like to do is we'd like to prepare a letter um, to the successful bidder and then uh, move forward with the purchase. So I think at this point in time, if there's any questions, maybe what I can do is just pass it back to the chair. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Councilor McLaughlin? Councilor McLaughlin, please. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering because I know at one time we talked about getting tractors to replace the uh, the sidewalk plows. Is that is that not correct? I, I've heard that comment before. Yeah, I don't know if Lane is still on. Uh, if maybe he could uh, answer your question, Councilor McLaughlin. I can answer that. Yeah, so. Um... Part of the next uh, budget, um, we actually do, I think, in the capital forecast that we do have one of our, our um, um, sidewalk machines to, to be uh, replaced. Um, and, and we've been talking internally in staff to look at actual um, actual tractors um, as one option. Uh, I know the, the city of Ottawa does it, um, but, but, but we haven't, as to date, we haven't done the, 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 the uh, um, research yet. Um, but it's one option that we'd be looking at is actually in, in, having having an enclosed tractor um, with that would be certain widths and everything that, that would fit on the sidewalks and everything. Yeah, and, and where I was coming from, Lane, is I wondered if possible that it could do the sidewalks in the winter and then we could put a more on it and it could do the more position in for the parks. That, that's where my comments were coming from. I have no idea. I don't know what this, what, whether it would be feasible or wouldn't be feasible. Once again, just trying to save a little money. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, the, one, the one thing we'd have to be all enclosed uh, for the winter and maybe Jordan can speak to it if, um, with this tractor if it's open or closed. Yeah, so, so a closed tractor would not work. And that was the question I was going to ask too, if that was removable, the cab. Uh, we need an open cab. And there's just, we we come across too much brush and, and we need to get into tighter spots and the cab would uh, inhabit that. So we wouldn't be able to do that. It was only a comment. No, it's a great comment. If I can just add, we'll look at that option. It could help with some roadside brushing. But for this, what this uh, tractor does is the slopes that Jordan was saying getting in and out but when we go to replace that piece of equipment we'll look at all options because it could be used to help with some of the other kind of roadside type mowing but no that's a, a totally great question and every time we replace a piece of equipment we should be looking at how it can be used for multiple ways. <coughs> Councillor Jackson please. Um, Jumpins, I almost forgot the question. I have to think about it. <laughs> if there's somebody else that has a question, then I'll I'll come back. But um, read rig your please. Oh, I know what it was. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Are we selling? Uh, we're replacing this other piece of equipment. So are we selling this piece of equipment on uh, Gov deals? Yes. And uh, with with the funding, will that the uh, revenue that is received, is it to go back into reserves? Uh, so that's a great question. So yes, uh, our plan is to sell this on Gov deals. Um, what are we worth? I couldn't tell you, it's a, it's a 93. Um, it does need a little bit of work. Um, and as far as, I, I don't know the process and maybe uh, Rob or Sean can clarify, but I do believe it goes into a reserve if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I can speak to it if it's worth we get enough money it's worth me doing the journal entry to put it into a reserve it will be done if we get um very minimal amount of money then obviously in my year-end reserve report i would tell you uh when i tell when i report on the disposals of assets that that didn't go into reserve so like i'm speaking of if there's like 300 dollars we got i'm i don't know if that would make its way into the reserve 
Um, but if we get, you know, a substantial amount, thousand dollars or whatnot, um, it would be a decision at that time. But yeah, typically when we do sell pieces of equipment, the proceeds would go back into reserve uh, with something that is a 1993, we would see at that point, but I'd report back to council. The only thing I the only thing I would add is it likely doesn't have any residual value on the book. So we would take that off and then any surplus goes usually on reserve, but I think we'll see what it's worth. But people buy all kinds of stuff on gov deals. I'll just make that comment. Thank you. Reeve Rigier. Uh, thank you, Mary. Just a, one question. If this is approved by council this evening, uh, Jordan, is it available immediately or do we have like a COVID six month turnaround time? <laughs> So the last time uh, that I spoke uh, with the dealerships that they do actually have these in stock. And that's a really good question because I know some of their equipment um, is being bought up pretty quickly because of this whole COVID stuff and they're having a hard time with manufacturers. Um, but this particular model was in stock the last time that uh, we had looked into it, so. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? Councilor McLaughlin, Council please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just having trouble to unmute. Uh, my question is, as soon as it comes into service, does that when it, the other lawnmower will go out of service and onto gub deals? Yeah, so that's the plan. Um, once we receive this, make sure we're satisfied with it and everything. Uh, and once we're once we put this into use, uh, that is the plan then to take the other one out of service. And put it on gov deals and if you and if it makes um you know sense too i can certainly just send an email to council just to give a heads up you know what's being surplused and when i i just just i like to see things that once we have it in service and we're happy with it it goes the other piece of equipment goes out of service unlike some that have hung on for too long a time but i'm, I'm glad to hear what you're saying jordan Thank you. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I beg for your uh, indulgence here. I had to give the internet over to my son to finish his homework. So um, I missed the first part of your presentation, Jordan. I just wanted to confirm where we're at with the assets. Um, so with the, with the purchase of this, we'll have two trucks, two trailers, two lawnmowers cutting every, all the grass that's all over the township. Yeah, you're correct. So, uh, I mean, aside from some of the smaller things like trimmers and chainsaws and, um, you know, different things to that nature, uh, you, you hit it bang on. So two trucks, two trailers, uh, two lawnmowers, um, and then all the, the small things to complete their jobs. So. Okay, and this uh, this piece of equipment is capable of doing everything from the slopes at Lookout Road to the um, slopes along the boat launches in all three locations. Yes, um, it can quickly do the ball diamonds. It can get into the playgrounds. Like it's it's fully functional for all the many different spots that we had to work at. Right, and so that's the plan too. And and I mean it is equipped with four wheel drive. So I mean there there. There is also hopes, depending on the attachments, um, you know, as we move along, we could do some beach maintenance with it as well. Excellent. So that might pick up seagull mess. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? None. Seeing none, call for vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Now we'll move on to 6.6 .6 tender, 2021-25 sand screening. Recommendation that the council in the Township of Whitewater Region approve the ward of tender, 2021-25 sand screening to Eastway Contracting Inc. at a cost of $25,973.73, inclusive of non-refundable HST. Motion and a seconder, please. Councillor Olmsted, Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Goes to Lane, please. Yeah, thank you. I won't spend too much time on the basic tender report. Um, I just want to outline that the uh, the, the sand screening won't happen till uh, um, September, um, as per uh, bank swallers in our pit. Um, and this sand screen is from 
uh, the township owned owned pit. Um, and just the last comment um, with consultation um, with our GPS and our uh, our spreader controls. Um, staff are looking um, at converting the, the remaining plow trucks to all um, Acetronics, so that would be able to, to track um, also track the, the plow up and plow down, and also the uh, spread rate um, would be tracked all in the GPS system for any future claims or even for for quantity yeah, for quantity tracking. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions? No. No, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. 6.7, tender 2021-24, gravel crushing, recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the award tender 2021-24, gravel crushing to Eastway Contracting Inc. at a cost of $90,346.88, inclusive of non-refundable HST. Motion and a seconder, please. Reeve Rigger and Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Back to Lane, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this, this tender here is for the gravel, the actual gravel crushing um, for our capital road program, F21, uh, which includes 10.7 uh, kilometers, um, which is shown uh, road there, which is Calvin Road, Blind Line, uh, two sections of Fletcher. Uh, McGonagall, Acres Road, and uh, Stoper Road. Um, it's all shown in the map also, um, which will be placed on the uh, town website showing our what we've done uh, from 2020, uh, 2021, this year proposed, and what's proposed for 2022. Um, also, the gravel, uh, this tender also includes um, gravel for projects, for, uh, for, the, for the capital projects, which include Cole Smith, West Ross and Rapid Road. Um, and just another point, um, so we did have five five bids on it um, and the price was actually 12 cents uh, less per ton than last year. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any questions? I see none. Seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. Thanks, Lane. You know, 6.9 Whitewater Seniors Home Support. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve. Sorry, Mayor. Sorry, yes, go ahead. I believe we missed one. Uh, eight and still scales feasibility. Oh, we did, I'm sorry. <laughs> I checked it off thinking it was the last one. Okay, sorry folks. 6.8 landfill scales feasibility. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region direct staff to proceed with a request for proposals to purchase and install away scales at the Ross landfill site. Motion and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Olmstead, Councillor Nicholson. Okay, thank you. Sorry, this goes back to Lane. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so this report is a little longer um, than the other ones. Um, so we did uh, have a new fee structure, as we're all aware, um, in 2021, we switched from volume to vehicle cl uh, classification to try to ease uh, make it quicker uh, for staff and, and make less uh, judgment calls. Um, and then on uh, April 27th, Council directed staff to prepare a report on, a report on feasibility uh, to bring in uh, weight scales into the landfill and also how it would be funded. Um, the three, pre, uh, three primary types um, of fee structures, um, which you, we do see in the surrounding landfills, um, so there's volume, which we did before, um, vehicle classification, which we have now, and then also weight. Um, e each fee uh, structure ha has it advantages and disadvantages. Um, but with the first two um, that are they are uh, um, subjective and uh, and and require staff to make to make judgment calls. Um, charging by weight is the most most accurate and fair method. Um, it's cut and dry. Um, for the weight, um, there, there is some draw, drawbacks. Um, the one is we're charging weight, um, charging weight for basically airspace, um, which is also density. Um, so, so that is one drawback. And the other one is the actual purchase of the scales, um, which we'll I'll provide uh, later in the report. Um, and then, then the other, the, the third one is actual the 
the actual um, it, 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 it's the site up op site operation um, where where the traffic's be all being funneled into one one area. Uh, and many times you have to go over the scale uh, twice or uh, three times depending on the actual load. Um, but 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 the, the big advantage um, that it brings that we'll actually have a, actually a, a, a unit versus a a estimation um, that, that's going into our landfill. Um, we'll still have to um, provide surveying. Um, right now we do it annually and part of our, our ECA, but potentially we, we could probably move that to um, every second year um, if we change that with our landfill expansion. Um, <coughs> and then the other one is actual um, it is knowing actually what, what, what's been collected from our from our curb side, curbside, um, that which we can compare from year to year. We can compare um, how much uh, 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 leaf and yard waste comes in, um, and it also uh, and also a skill can be provided um, for for future the landfill for waste uh, transfer site if it ever ever happened um, in the future. Um, waste right now um, scales were. Um, Always been have been talked about over the years, um, and also um, with this year we have the the Ross landfill expansion feasibility study, um, which will look at um, expanding the actual landfill, and also um, with a site plan, um, which will outlay um, any future buildings or uh, waste diversion areas, and also scale location. Um, and then also um, how the trunk, how the actual site functions for traffic wise, and if, it, if the entrance and location um, is in the right spot or not. Um, we do have a lot of queuing onto, onto the roadway, um, which looking at it in staff would, would recommend moving the actual location to allow queuing um, onto the scale. Um, and then the, uh, so in surrounding municipalities, um, which in short in the, in the attachment, um, the, the town of Renfrew, uh, township of uh, McNabb Brayside, and the Ottawa Valley Waste Recovery um, also they, they all charge by weight, um, ranging from ninety dollars to one hundred and fifty dollars, um, as shown in the attached the attached uh, comparison. Um, we have met uh, last year um, when staff were, were looking at scales. We we met with uh, uh, one company. Um, and we actually met with a company uh, 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 this week, actually, um, just to, to get some, some information on scales uh, before we go to get, get to, um, some background information. Um, sorry. Um, and if, if you can go to the financial implications, sorry, Carmen. Um, so the, the, the cost would, would vary um, depending on the, the actual the length of scale. Um, uh, what, we, we, what we've been told that uh, 40 foot is most common in landfills. Um, but the challenge of that, that, that it won't accept um, uh, any very large vehicles like such as transports, um, which we don't get uh, that many. We might have one or two. I think we've had two this year so far, but, um, but and then that can still be, um, it is, uh, but that, that still can be weighed. Um, it wouldn't meet the uh, uh, scale of weights Canada, but um, you can actually weigh the, the actual tractor part of the of the, the tractor trailer than actually the trailer. Um, but I think as long as we, we advertise that and they're accepted, um, that would that would that would meet the uh, requirement. Um, and just looking at anything bigger than forty feet, which we'd have to look at more, um, it, it's the actual fit in in the actual land in the landfill. Um, and where the proposed landfill is, is in the in the buffer zone of the landfill, same with the scale house. Um, if we go any longer, um, it does eat, eat a little bit into the buffer zone uh, in the actual landfill um, active phase. Um, but but that's one thing we'd have to figure out um, is what type of lengths we'd actually want uh, before we go out for a, a request for proposal. Um, and yeah, and, and, the, and the pricing um, does range from uh, 75,000 to 125,000 uh, uh, for, um, depending, on, depending on the type of scale and also the, the lengths. Um, the, and, and, the, 
and what was in them pricing is the actual the actual scale itself um which is very um changing every week or what i've been told i uh, just because it is mostly heavy duty steel and with steel pricing jumping um on a weekly basis that um is a moving target um then the other larger cost of the actual foundation for the the actual scale and then the approaches um which is all in concrete um then the other part is the actual uh, delivery and install, and then also the, the computerized system that we can track. Um, we can track each user, um, and it also gives accountability, um, and it also helps staff. That it, it tracks each load, and then um, it can and it would track if if prices had to be changed or not. Um, you have to if, if you provide quite, uh, uh, provide a, a reason why it would change, um, but it would give. Um, staff and also residents that this is the number on the on the on the remote screen um the actual weight difference um that would be a benefit to, to all to the residents and to staff um and then so the funding uh we do have a balance of uh just over 60 uh, sorry of, of fifty six thousand dollars in the waste management reserve um we estimate that additional forty thousand contribution will be added in, in, in 2021 uh, budget. Um, and if approved by council, um, the next would, would prepare a, uh, a, a, a request for proposal um, to install a weight scale um, and also uh, finalize the site plan from JP2G to, um, so, we, so, so we get the, the, the correct uh, fl uh, traffic flow pattern right and also the right spot for, um, and for for the 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 site the sorry the the site improvements um, for gates or for any road um, which is not included in this price. This is the price here is only for the actual uh, scale itself. And for that, I'll turn it back to yourself, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Questions, please, Clerk. Councilor Jackson. Councilor Jackson, please. I guess the first question I have, so um, when we go back to your report, it says on April 27th, council directed staff to prepare a report on the feasibility of introducing weight scales. And then I look further on and the Ross landfill expansion feasibility set study has commenced, which includes a revised site plan. Are we jumping the gun here? Is like, I thought we were doing one in the same and I understand we've um, need to know some information, but originally it was scheduled for 2022 and now we're pushing it forward to 2021. I'm just wondering the justification with regards to that. Uh, Lynn, do I, maybe I'll start. So the, the 2021 budget included the site plan review. So just making sure we're optimizing the operations of the site and that what expansion would look like to make sure we know all our options. Uh, and then following that, so that's ongoing, and, and weight scales were going to be contemplated as part of that. And then since that time, we also got a direction to look at weight scales now based on the issues we're facing. So the, the thing about issuing an RFP is those two can be considered at the same time. And as, as JP2G finalizes the site plan, um, they would include the, the weight scales. So the question is, the this has not been budgeted for the weight scales it would be in 2022. We'd have to confirm the source funding, but it's ordering it so that we implement it in a timely fashion. So they're, they're going, uh, we didn't recommend weight scales this year, but based on the issues we've been having, getting weight scales can be accommodated on the site and that would be incorporated into JP2G's ongoing work on the site plan and improving the operations of the site. It's just whether or not you want us to proceed now versus waiting till January to order it and implementing this by the time this is in place at a much later date versus the pressures we've been having since we changed the fee structure. So I, I guess depending on how long it takes to order, but you can, you don't have to exactly wait until January 1st to order to put it into the next year. You can order it in the previous year. It doesn't hit the books until when it's received. Um, so if you order it in December or November, doesn't hit the books until it's received. It's not received until April, 2021. It's recorded in, tw in 2022, sorry, um, and not 2021. So that's not an issue for me, but the issue I have is, are we jumping the gun? 
should we be finishing the feasibility study and the outline of where things should go before and what size we should be specifically ordering rather than going the opposite, ordering and purchasing, finding out that one, similar to what the city of Pembroke did with their fire truck, uh, they get a fire truck that's too big to go into their building and they end up building a, a new fire hall. Um, I don't want to get into a situation where we're backtracking I want to make sure that um, we're ordering the right specified piece of equipment, the right length of, of piece of equipment. We know exactly where we're going to put it. We know the cost that's going to be involved to not only bring in the piece of equipment, but to operate that equipment. Is there computer programs that are required? Um, I just, I think at this point in time, while I agree um, I've resigned to the fact that it would be nice to have the uh, weigh scales. I just think we're jumping the gun. We need to know exactly what size, where is it going to go? What's the traffic flow going to look like right now, the way it exists now? Um, I don't know. And I, I have not been at the, the landfill site very often um, and certainly in a, in a long time. But right now, I can't see it. Um, getting installed where the shack sits right now and maybe it can be but until we get all of those details and what size of installation we need I think that's more important to get it right the first time and not try to solve an issue after it's already been purchased. And, and maybe Lane can speak to the discussion with JP2J. Yeah. I just want to say that the RFP and the tendering process would be in keeping with the work JP2G is doing, but I'll, um, and the question is when you order this is important because it, it's a question of how you charge at the landfill. So the longer you wait, the longer you're changing the implementation, but maybe Lane can speak to the discussion with JP2G on how the site would work and how that fits into the, the site work. The feasibility I think is on the expansion side. So instead of, so that we have more space for to extend the useful life of the landfill as well. But I'll leave it to uh, uh, Lane if you can. Yeah. Right, but then perhaps that scale needs to be in a different location when we go to expand is what I'm saying. So how difficult is that going to be to move a scale over as well as any hut that is associated with that scale for the staff to be in and to maintain um, the, the proper programming and that is going to be required to um, allow for that. Um, and obviously I realize that we're not gonna be charging by, um, by the weight until we get the scale. So, I mean, that is, uh, I don't know how long that takes to implement. I don't know what, what kind of notification we have to give, but even if we know that the scale is being um, installed and you know, we have to give 20 days notice for a fee change, then it's 20 days notice to, for a fee change once we know where it's going to go and the effective date where it's going to be set up. I don't think that's an issue, but uh, I'll let Lane answer the rest. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and you made all good points, uh, Councillor Jackson. Um, the uh, I'll, I'll start off with the, um, if we wanted to put it in, um, ready for even for the 2022 fee schedule. Um, this couldn't really be, couldn't be installed in the wintertime. It'd have to be installed uh, during the summertime. Um, right now, just for all of the, the concrete slab and the steel have to go in for the, the actual structure for the, what it holds a scale. Um, yeah, and then the feasibility study that we're doing with JP2G right now is the actual expansion of the actual landfill itself. Um, and, and then also the part of that was just the um, site plan, how it, how the site plan lays out. Um, so basically, like, you know, where we, we put the traffic and stuff. Um, staff has, have, have looked at it. Um, we're actually, we're, um, we looked at it um, previous to this and then also today again. Um, and and basically we're probably not moving the actual uh, scale house that is now, um, but that would drive price. Um, and it does work because uh, um, it's not in the buffers. It, so it, it, the whole part of the where scale would be 
and actual the and, and the scale house would be in the buffer zone of the landfill, which we can't bring that to fit the active area to it. Um, and even in the expansion, what expansion would be um, would be located that this would not be moved. Um, so it, it would work in future locations. Um, but the one thing, if, if we did go ahead with uh, pushing the scale, um, we would have time to to work out with uh, JP2G um, uh, where the actual, if it is the best spot for it, um, which staff feels it is, um, but then actually how it would work out for the actual moving the entrance and any roads would have to be um, like for, for, for that, like the actual driveway into it. Um, and, and also any, and also the area for the waste aversion. Um, it's more for that area um, that, that is staff is not, not, not recommending actually moving the actual, the, the actual building that's there now. Um, cause that would also drive up costs, especially, um, with the pricing in, in, in building materials now. Um, so it would, would, would be the right spot for it. Um, it'd have to be, and be close enough, uh, to the building that, um, residents and, and staff can, can, can communicate with each other. Um, but, but the one thing would uh, and the JP also doing is the, the main point of it too of the, of the site plan um, is where to actually put the waste diversion areas. Um, that's critical um, is in it, having same as the, 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 similar to the, 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 the Ottawa waste recovery. Um, they have a sawtooth design, um, which where you put all, 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 all the, all the, the um, uh, um, cycling bins in one area, um, which they drive up on. Um, and also, um, if, 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 it, if you had garbage, you can store garbage in a bin versus driving up to the, the actual face of the landfill. Um, and same as like any furniture and stuff like that, you wouldn't have to drive, actually drive up to the, the face of the landfill. You just put it in this waste diversion area. Um, and nothing more JP, JP2G is looking at. Um, and also point with the scale, but was talking to them um, preliminary that we feel that with, with, with not moving the actual scale house, that the scale has to be located very close to that spot. I'm still not convinced. I still think we're putting the cart before the horse. Uh, I think we need to have a more fulsome understanding of what the actual cost is going to be and not just for the scale, but how that scale is going to be incorporated into the overall flow of traffic in and out of the um, landfill site and how that's going to come about as what well, because that's an extra cost that we don't currently have as well. So that all has to be associated with um, the cost of the scale, in my opinion. Um, and it's fine to say that, you know, the scale is going to cost between 75 and 125. Well, that's $50,000 difference but it also says that it's going from 40 feet to 80 feet. Well, what do we require? Isn't that something that we're hiring JP2G as a consultant to come up with before we go out to an RFP? Uh, I think that's important. Yeah, so part of the JP2G wasn't um, to, to, to determine what lengths of scale. Um, it was more this the actual um, the staff would know the best um, versus uh, the, the, the consultant of what we would need. Um, just for, for numbers, uh, the, the town of Renfrew is 40 feet uh, and talking to the other scale uh, company that they're, um, the most of the landfills are 40, but uh, talking to, 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 to McNabb Brace side, there's 80 feet um, and all of Valley Waste Recovery is, is 80 feet also. Um, the, but I think with, 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 with the two other sites, McDowell and all of the waste recovery, I think it's more about, um, it's more actually for, I think, transports, um, which again, we don't get that many. Um, and even looking at, at, at the site um, with, an 80, with an 80 foot um, uh, scale, it actually would be a lot of, to take, 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 take a lot of, a lot of um, um, real estate up. Um, but the one thing that we were going to check out um, before we put the RFP out was is what are long longest um, our longest vehicles um, other than other than uh, uh, tractor trailers, but it would actually be the actual the actual farm tractors with wagons. So it's one one thing we we're going to find out um, 
it, it, what's that, uh, that actual length, and then that would dictate what our lengths of scale would, would be. I think it's important to get all those answers done before we go out to RFP and to confirm with JP2G that there is enough space for a traffic flow um, before we go out to RFP. I don't know, I just feel this one is being rushed through. Those are my comments. Councilor Kai. I just wonder when it says um, 75 to 125, the 75 or whatever the cost is, is that just the scale? That's not the cement, any of the other stuff, is it? That, that, that's, that's everything. That's the actual scale, the, the concrete foundation, computer system, um, the remote sensors, um, all that. And we actually installed okay. it. Yeah. So the uh, 125 would obviously be the 80 foot one. Is that right? That's correct. That's, that's, uh, that's the kind of estimates we've um, were provided. Um, and, and we looked at previous tenders, what's been around um, in that range. Um, the pricing are going up again, as I said before, with the, all the steel pricing. So it is a variable and we won't know that until it actually uh, proposals came in. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor, you're on mute, but um, Neil, uh, Councillor Nicholson, and then uh, Councillor McLaughlin. You're on mute, Mayor. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Councillor Nicholson, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lane, just a question. I, I wasn't quite sure for transfer station. Sorry, I'm getting the signal. My internet connection is unstable. So um, oh, I'll start again. It, the uh, if we were to act as a transfer station at some time into the future, is that a 40 or an 80 foot required? Do they transfer on track to trailers or do they transfer on tandems? T typically, there be a, you would ship out on a tractor trailer. Um, and then that's when we, act, we, we actually discussed uh, with staff um, is that at, at that point, um, it, most of the scales are module. Um, so you definitely just move one end out um, and <coughs> sorry and 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 actually expand on it um, but and then also we, we looked at, at our what, what our landfill is is um, our, our, our life of the expand our, of the the landfill and also the expansion um, if it's between 20 and 30 years um, you know what the scale of lifetime uh, will, will be will be between 20 and 30 years. Um, depending on if, if the, the maintenance on it. Um, by then, um, if we're moving to a transfer station, you'd probably look at a whole new um, like, yeah. uh, site, not a site, but uh, area where to put it, um, scales and also um, how to compact on, to, on the, uh, how to compact into the tractor trailer. Yeah, okay. So the transfer thing, depending on the study, could be a, uh, a red herring in this discussion. Okay. No, I'm good. I uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council McLaughlin. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm kind of like Councillor Jackson, but first off to answer maybe to help with uh, Councillor Nicholson's question, there are all kinds of scales around that way tractor trailers, like there's the Antrim truck stop, there's uh, Miller's uh, we can see in Cobden like we could be loading those trailers and then having them weigh if we were going to transfer rather than having to expand and make our, our own scales bigger I guess that, that would be my feasibility for staying with the 40 foot uh but I, I have to agree with Councillor Jackson. I want to do this. I like the idea, but I want to do it once and I want to do it properly. So I don't understand what the rush is. Like the people have kind of accepted and uh, whether keep, I would say stay with our, our 
structure that we have now, until we are positive that this is what we want, this is where it goes. And uh, I think once people see that we're moving forward, they would be very acceptable to the structure that we have now. And I want to see it done properly. So that, that's my questions. My comments, I should say. Okay, thank you. Clerk, see any other questions? Councillor Olmsted. Councillor Olmsted, please. Uh, just, just want to clarify, <laughs> request for proposal. So request for proposal, does that not mean we're actually uh, putting out, um, so there's not an actual tender, but an RFP for consideration of, of what companies would do. We, we <laughs> give them some sort of a scope on what we're looking at. And then they actually give us some some suggestions on scales and uh, you know different uh, metrics and uh, technical standards of scales. And I know they don't they don't give us uh, what I imagine they would they could give us some insight into traffic flow and that kind of stuff too. Could they not? And that's uh, correct. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, no. I just did. I, but the way I considered this this uh, RFP was. Uh, if we like it, we like it. We we can go with one of the options, and if we don't like it, then then we don't have to do anything. Or I, am I kind of missing the mark there? Yeah, you are correct. Um, either way, if we're, if with a tender or RFP, we would um, all come back for, for, for the award. Um, staff, too often you, you, we could go with a tender because um, we do kind of know what we want. Um, is staff we're looking at it and. Uh, we feel that RFP would be the best um, as we don't have a, have a design um, actually for the scale. And we, we know generally everywhere we want it. Um, and, and, but, but we are, we we're not experts in scales. Um, so it, it was a question proposal that they they would submit uh, proposals to us. Um, we, and we would rank them on uh, obviously on price and on, on warranty and, um, and, and even even I ranked them on on um, um, suggestions in the proposal. So if if they had you know if they recommended, for example, uh, eighty foot or or even even moving it to to a different location, um, if, it, if valid reasons. So we would score that, um, and and that's why we feel that that's better than a tender in this uh, on this um, item. I can just so, add. If I just add, you're right in terms of an RFP is a problem in search of a solution, and usually the technical solution. I just want to also reiterate that JP2G is not divorced from this process. And the other thing is, if council is comfortable, we're responding to a notice of motion that said, look at weight scales. If you're not um, in a rush on weight scales, we don't have to do weight scales. My understanding was there was a determination by council when we were directed to bring forward this report that weight scales was the option to deal with the, the controversies and the issues with how uh, rates are being done. So JP2G would be part of the technical review of this thing as part of an RFP and also ensuring the site flow and all the things that have been mentioned in terms of the operation. We're not gonna buy something and, and plot it in the middle of the, the current operations. It goes with a fulsome review of, of how the site operates. Um, and 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 in response to a direction to bring this forward, so just want to highlight that. Selfishly, I, I want this thing installed as quick as possible. <laughs> From the bills I've been getting, um, of course, that I, I, I am joking about that. But I, I just want a clarification on. So we're 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 seeking information here from companies. We don't have to act on it if we don't if we if we find that it's not really what we want. We don't have to act on. It. I think that's kind of. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. If we if we if we do go ahead with uh, request for proposals, um, you know, if it came back, obviously, if price came back too high, or um, right. or if you determined that council determined that, that you know it wasn't the time to to actually go with, um, there's more more outs and more um, and more more we can we can suggest as council or staff to council what what direction or right. we can go later. Okay, on. great. I'm I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Uh, one additional question. So when we do have the scales put in, will the contractor uh, be going over those scales on a daily basis when they're 
dumping, um, like right now, millers, when they're bringing in the landfill that they've been picking up at everybody's um, stop. And currently, what is the practice? There's a staff member there, obviously, and the gate is open, uh, available for millers, or they have a key, um, but they don't have to necessarily be right at the gate uh, or at the gate house, I should say. Um, so what is the extra cost to that, um, to have somebody uh, have be in the way house or the uh, to maintain that there is an extra cost to have a staff member there. Is that an extra staff? Is that that? What are we doing taking away? Like what jobs are we taking away from the staff that is normally there doing cover while Miller's is dropping off um, the garbage that's being collected? Yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, so, so we, we actually, um, we, we, we asked that question with uh, the, the scale company we, we met. Um, the one thing we would propose as staff would, is that the the curbside collection of millers they could come up or or even um, uh, public work staff or rec staff when they come in um, when they, they can actually go on the scale that have a key fob it would track the weight um, they, then their dump come back and track the weight and then so it'd be all tracked um, uh, even, uh, even when no one was no one was there um, it, so it's safe for recovering. Um, and, and also, if you're looking at new gates, um, the, the, the suggestion would be to have key fob into the gate that it, it, it would open up. They can they can go dump. So we, we were, so we're tracking the amount of people coming in um, and tracking all the waste that's that's going into the landfill. So there is an additional cost to that key fob type of um, computerization. Um, do you know what kind of cost? that be as opposed to hiring somebody to look after the way scales yeah so the the actual um, uh, software that um, that same software as, as other companies um, so um, other municipalities have um, with actually the, the, the recommendation from one one of the uh, scale companies um, and they actually include um, um, uh, uh, um, so a, a a auto attendant um, 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 system, um, which would, which would be above the cost, but it's, I think it's, they, 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 they stated anywhere between like a thousand, two thousand dollars extra, depending on um, the, the the actual system. And, and also included in that price, uh, I believe the software was was, was around seven thousand um, for the actual weight scale software, which was which is included in that in that range. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Councilor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson, please. Oops. Thank you, Lane. I appreciate your patience on this one. Um, yeah, I'm with Councillor Olmstead with this. I see an RFP as an opportunity for us to take to get a to get technical input from a provider. And I would just offer that when that comes back to council for a final decision to accept the RFP or tender it or whatever the next steps would be in the case that we do have that site layout, the diagram, and, uh, and it would include the secondary or tertiary impacts or operating costs. Um, I like the idea of a FOB. I can see the FOB being very popular. <laughs> it would have to be tracked very closely, but uh, I like the way this is going. I think this is the feedback we're getting from the residents of the community that they want more fidelity in their charges for use of the landfill. And I think this is one way to achieve it. So I'm in support of an RFP as long as uh, before we actually agree to the, the purchase, we see some of those other questions answered. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mackay. Councillor Mackay, please. Uh, once we put all this stuff in, will the price of garbage be more expensive to dump there or less? Um, so based on in the comparison, um, the <coughs> um, based on the comparison, if if uh, Carmen can scroll down, um, the, the other municipalities in the, in the area that uh, tip are, you know, they range between uh, ninety five dollars um, and and 
and 150 depending on your non-partner in the out-of-valley waste recovery. Um, and also depends on the actual weight. Um, um, it, it, you know, it, it, it all, the weight would totally different. If, if you have a full truckload of, of feathers, for example, um, or the next one behind you, you have all stone or brick. Um, there's all through that, you know, it's the same, same volume, but the actual price um, is, is a lot more. Um, so so it, 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 it's all about, about the actual weight you're bringing in. So, yeah. Gotcha. Uh, Treasurer, you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to add, and it won't take up too much time, obviously, here, but I think with that type of question, we likely wouldn't know the effect, and it's going to take years of data, but at least with a system like this, you have accurate data that you can have a running average or you have an average from, you know, from, from the busy months of the year of what's coming in. And then it allows you to more accurately um, set your fees per, per whatever weight is per pound or ton or whatever it is. But without the data, you're kind of thrown on a dartboard with the data over the course of time. Um, you can start to forecast more accurately to come up with a more accurate fee. That's fair for everybody. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. No? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, Reverie here, I'm sorry. I see hand, I'm not sure. Yeah, hey, yeah. Re Reverie here, Thank please. you, thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking now with, with uh, Councillor Nicholson and Councillor Olmstead here and Councillor Jackson. I think we go out for the RFP, get it back and take a look at it then and see where we go from there. But I think if we do that, we'll have to change the recommendation because right now it looks like the recommendation is to a request or a proposal to purchase and install. So I think we probably have to possibly change that recommendation if we're just right now still seeking information. So just if I can uh, be clear, so it would be, so the scope of the RFP is is the purchase and installation and everything that comes with it. So that would be part of it. Uh, to, um, an RFI, a request for information where you're not doing anything is a whole different other pro process. So what we're just saying here, we're gonna ensure with JP2G that we outline in the RFP process how the site we have and what what is, um, what we're generally looking for and seeing from proponents the technology that's available that would fit with the site. Um, and then when that comes back with the RFP, we would confirm all that uh, as Councillor Nicholson had noted in terms of all the other operational requirements, but the quote that um, the, the range that uh, Lane put in his report speaks to those associated costs. Um, oh, okay. So the RFP would be for the purchase and the installation. So it's not just, we're not just buying a piece of equipment. We also, how it would be implemented and all the stuff that comes with it. So that would be the RFP process versus a tender, which would just be, okay. we want this, 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 and this. This is, we want a solution to this problem that we have. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so are we clear on that then, CIO? We're happy with what you just said. Yeah, the RFP gives you the, the flexibility to look at a range of solutions and then scoring them and making that recommendation to council on how to move forward and, and when. Okay, so just to clarify, we're not changing the recommendation then? No, I think it's fine in terms of the process we would go through. Okay, so at this time then I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Carried. Carried, thank you. Also at this time, I would uh, like to request an extension of time. Do I have a motion to extend time? It's 7.40 right now. Mover, uh, re, re, uh, sorry, re, re, here. Okay, do we have a seconder? Councillor Mackay. All in favor? Carried. Sorry, could I oh, ask a sorry. question? Could yes, we please. put a limit on that? <laughs> um, we still have yeah. quite a, a bit to go through and, and maybe we need to move the closed session to another um, day, even if it's a separate meeting. Um, would the CAO be, would the CFO, CAO be happy with 30 minutes extension? Sure, we do have to review the closed session matters because of implications on the union decertification and the process going forward. But we can, I think my two reports are fairly 
to the point and the closed session can happen. Um, I would say we could be completed by 8.30 at the very latest. Okay. Is as long as we have a time period, then I'm okay with it. I don't okay. want to be here all so night. 45 minutes then. Just to give us a little extra. Okay. Is everyone happy? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Now, CAO, we're on to you, 6.9. Whitewater Seniors, recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve agreements for the Whitewater Seniors Home Support and Active Living Pilot. Motion and a seconder, please. Councilor Nicholson. We <laughs> read here. Okay, thank you. Uh, this goes to Rob, please, CAO. I think this is just a kind of the culmination of the good work of the task force and the grant money we got. So we got $60,000 to do this. So there's a poster attached there that really speaks to the services that will now be accessible in Whitewater Region through the partnership with Care for and Run for Home Support. So the coordinator role is really just referring people so that they know all these programs exist and making sure that's happening and also connecting the stakeholders and the volunteers in the community. So we have a memorandum of understanding with the two partners. Uh, and then we also have a letter of intent uh, with the, the new owner of the former Scotia Bank, who has donated uh, six months of free rent to utilize that space. So hopefully with COVID um, uh, um, hopefully stopping and or slowly going there, that space will be available to do some of that referral work and help seniors and it's centrally located within the township. So this is a good news story. Um, we do have um, support from all the partners, including uh, Minister Cho, who we did meet with previously at uh, the, Ro the Roma conference, also has provided a quote for a news release. So this is just the culmination of all that work associated with the grant funds of $60,000 we did. And also this is the main kind of um, due project that came out of the needs assessment and the age-friendly plan. Okay, thank you. Any questions, show of hands? Seeing none, call. Council Nicholson. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to just take this moment to thank the uh, the folks involved that were in process, that were involved in this process. Um, the members of our own seniors and older adults task force, the Reeve, Dennis Harrington from Renfrew Seniors Home Support, Alice Brennan from Care For. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this the fruits of our labors over the last two years, um, how this comes to fruition. And with the 1500 or so seniors that we have that live in our community, I am uh, very hopeful that they are gonna see a massive return on investment on the $60,000 and it's gonna impact the lives of as many of those 1500 seniors as possible. Um, the biggest uh, reward I'll see at the end of this pilot is that we wanna continue it and the seniors in our community see it as, a, as something that needs to continue to stay there to, to, to ensure that they're not stuck in place, but in Whitewater Region, they're able to age in place. And, and if we can realize that over the next 12 months, we've, got a, we've successfully achieved something for the long term. So I just wanted to thank everybody, as well as staff, Rob in the background, making sure that everything was eyes were dotted and T's are crossed. Thank you so much. I'm glad to finally be at the point where we're gonna open the door. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Seeing none, um, call for vote. All in favor? Carried, thank you. 6.10, delegations at AMO. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region receive this report for information purposes as it relates to delegate delegation results at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, bracket AMO, virtual conference to be held August 15th through 18th, 2021. Motion and a seconder, please. Councilor Mackay, Councilor Jackson. Uh, Rob. So the, the thank you, Mr. Mayor. The topics are noted in there. It's our opportunity to kind of get some face time with ministers. Our time with Minister Chow, Cho got us two grants to fund the seniors pilot, so it can pay off. So we tried to reflect a reasonable amount of requests and delegations for because these take time to prepare and they reflect also recent kind of uh, direction and big issues that council has raised 
and we'll also also take the time to meet with all parties as much as possible to tell them about whitewater region so uh, the deadline is the seventh and, and we'll submit this and get feedback as we prepare the submissions okay thank you uh, any questions saying no. no oh, oh. Oh, okay. Councilor Nicholson, you tricked me. Go ahead, though. No, he Councilor doesn't, Nicholson. doesn't have it. <laughs> we're good. No, we're good? Yeah. Okay, call for vote. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Now we're going to item seven, notice of motion. Does anyone have a notice of motion? Show of hands, please. Sorry. Uh Councillor Nicholson, Councillor McLaughlin. I apologize, people. I accidentally muted the um, mayor. Okay, we on now? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nicholson, please. Uh, Mayor, I'm just going to ask for a notice of motion that I could uh, seek council support uh, to volunteer to be a committee member on one of the uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities committees, and that'll come uh, forward in the next uh, next meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Clerk. Who was the next one? Was it Council McLaughlin? Yeah. Council McLaughlin, please. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm just. Uh, seeking to see if we can soon come with a report on the uh, the pickup of uh, the grass, uh, <clears throat> the yard waste, if that would be coming forward in the near future. Uh, CAO, you wanna take that one? Yeah, it would likely come in the quarterly report where we would report on it. But um, if it requires kind of direction, more direction than that, it can be a separate report as well. So I know they have, I was talking to Steve and Lane, they have the stats. So we'll make note of that, Councillor, and I'll make sure that that comes back to Council um, when possible. Yeah, I, I would just like to see it as so sooner than later. But that's fine. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson? Uh, just a question, uh, maybe with regards to the projects portion of the pages for Whitewater Region, um, when that is going to be updated? I know that uh, some of them have gone out to tender, so I, I think it's the gravel road, Grace. Um, there's a few that need to be updated. So, uh, Lane, did you? I, I know you have yeah. the bulk of these. Uh, no, and I apologize, Council. Um, we um, we have been uh, preparing uh, letters and everything, um, and we, we just um, the, the meeting was for Gray Street just to, to have a startup. Um, I can tell you the schedule is uh, in July, um, but the so we, we we wanted to and that we just got, um, so we are sending out letters hopefully this week. Uh, well, it will be this week for that, uh, North of all residents there, um, and that will be put on to the, the page. I, but, but, but I do apologize, um, the, the few projects haven't been updated yet, but it will be. And West Ross Road? Oh uh, yeah, so, so, that will, so the same thing will be, uh, um, be notified to all residents. Um, uh, when we are starting, the, uh, the first one we're starting is the uh, Rapid Road first um to, to get that to get that done so we can have the powers road and that done at the same time for the dst part um but then the next part will be working on uh west ross and also um cold smith yeah. there's just a, there's a few people that have motorcycles out here this way it would be nice to know whenever and they don't live on west ross so uh, um they may not get notification that um, West Ross is going to be done. So it would be nice to know before you start down the road, you get a halfway, you can't turn around because they're ripping up um, the pavement. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else? No. Seeing nothing, we'll move on, please. 
eight adoption of minutes, <clears throat> May 19th regular council meeting. Recommendation of the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the regular minutes of May 19, 2021. Motion and a seconder, please. Councilor Mackay and Councilor Romstead. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Number nine, correspondence 9.1, three-step roadmap to safety, reopening Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Um, a good possibility this is gonna change. This was May 27th, so it's for correspondence only. Now we're down to bylaws. Recommendation, be it resolved that the bylaws listed on the June 2nd, 2021 agenda be taken as read and passed. Motion and seconder, please. Councilor Mackay. Reeve Rigier. Reeve Rigier. All in favor? Carrie, okay, thank you. And now at this time we'll move into closed session. Recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region move into closed session at 7.52 p.m. as permitted under section nine of the procedural bylaw to discuss labor relations bracket forward slash employee negotiations and personal matters about an identifiable individual, including <clears throat> municipal or local board employees with the CAO, deputy clerk and treasurer deputy CAO remaining in the room to discuss compensation review policy implications. Motion and seconder, please. Councillor uh, Olmstead yeah. and Councillor Mackay. I don't know. Okay, Councillor <laughs> Councillor Olmstead and Councillor Mackay. We are now in uh, closed session. Seven fifty-three. <clears throat> Sorry, seven fifty-three p.m. And just um, 